Hey everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. Today we've got Isaiah Salvador with us. Am I saying your last name right? We should have done that in the Saldivar. pre-show. Saldivar, you're good. Saldivar, Saldivar. cool. Saldivar. He is with us today and we are going to be discussing a few videos that we have made in the past uh, regarding the Leviathan spirit and a 2021 prophecy with Isaiah in it. So honored to have him with us here today. You guys stay tuned. It's going to be an exciting program. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Guys, we've got an exciting program for you today, but before we get into it, I want to remind you that Remnant Radio is entirely crowdfunded, so if you want to support conversations like this, there are links in the description for both PayPal or Patreon. You can give a one-time gift there on PayPal or a reoccurring gift on Patreon. As low as five bucks a month, you get access to extra content like videos we make with some of our guests, and uh, we get like book clubs and live Q&As and things like that, so check those out as well. Uh, I want to introduce everyone to our conversation today. Uh, this isn't a heretic hunting. This isn't a bride bashing opportunity. Uh, many of you know that we are charismatics who uh, violently believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Man, we we really, really believe in these things. And there's been a rise of prophetic voices, uh, especially in 2021, and we saw a lot of destruction there. So we thought, why don't we start making videos where we listen to prophetic words and show the body of Christ how to fulfill uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 19 through 22, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 29, uh, which tells us to judge prophecy, uh, to let one prophet speak weigh what's being said, and to, to not despise prophecy, but to cling to what is good and reject what is evil. So we've been trying to exercise that, display that. We've also done a series on deliverance where uh, we talk about, hey, what do we think about this spirit or that spirit? Lots of charismatics say these things. We've picked some of the most popular videos on the internet on discernment, and we've responded to some of those to help people think through some of those things critically. One of the people that we uh, have talked about in both of those segments was Isaiah. Uh, I've recently uh, been able to connect with Isaiah and build a I, I think a decent friendship with the guy. I really like his stuff. In all of the videos, we say, man, we like this guy. He's not, you know, uh, uh, swinging uh, uh, to the wind when it comes to some of these prophetic words. I think he's making contact with quite a bit of this stuff. And then additionally, with some of the discernment stuff, uh, there seems to be a lot of agreement on holiness and how demons get in and how we cast demons out, but maybe some disagreement on some of those nuances. So without further ado, I want to introduce you guys to everybody today. I've got Michael Miller. What? Which way do I point? That oh, way. Michael We've got Michael Roundtree right, right beneath me uh, and yeah. Isaiah right there. Uh, hey, you I'm guys, excited to be here. Isaiah, thank you so much for coming on, man. It, it, we were talking about this before. It, it requires quite a bit of bravery to come on with three other guys that disagree with you, uh, but then to come on and just kind of discuss some of this stuff online. I think it's going to be pretty fruitful. Um, yeah, I'm excited. I told the guys, I said, look, I have some friends in the chat, some pastor friends. If they decide to jump me, I'll call them in. So, hey, some of my demons yeah, guys God. are ready to go in case. No, I'm excited, <laughs> yes. man. I'm honored to be on here. I know it's fun. I know you guys joke with each other all the time. So I'm going to jump in here as a fourth guy, just messing with you guys, joking Please with you guys. Do. I'm super, super excited to be on here. I know God has a plan. I know God's going to move. And uh, yeah, man, any, any, I'm always open to criticism. I've always told people, listen, if I'm posting stuff online, then people can make videos about it. People can talk about or ask questions and so i pray that today we're able to bring some answers to some of these questions and i don't know if i'm lagging on your guys's end i'm lagging on my end uh the internet looks fine but hopefully it clears out as we go so yeah i'm excited man thanks for having me on excellent yeah definitely definitely want to commend you for your boldness and coming on and uh excited that, that god's building uh bridges with you so so thank you so much and and isaiah i was wondering too it, you have this like really josh if you could show his background this really cool background and you know one of our, <laughs> our, our co-host michael michael miller we call him affectionately basement boy and i was just wondering if maybe you could give <laughs> the guy a little help in his background <laughs> and the just, aesthetic back there it's, it's, it's just clear josh set this up uh, whoa, 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 this, this whoa. cement wall it's just <laughs> naked because josh was too well, cheap it's a, it looks good man i like it you can only do so much with a basement miller there's only so much. So anyway, <laughs> uh, anyway uh, yeah, so thanks so much for for coming on the show, Josh. Uh, so what do we have to look forward to today? Well, Isaiah, before we like dive into it, I want to know a little bit about yourself. Tell us about yourself. Tell us about your ministry. How do people follow you? How do they connect with you? Uh, I want to hear a little bit about your story before we dive into our content today. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of areas of agreement and camaraderie, and I would actually say probably the majority of things we agree on rather than disagree on. 
Uh, so let's start there. Let, tell us about yourself. Tell us about your ministry before we dive into our subject today. Yeah, so I was uh, an atheist for years. I got radically saved in 2011. I basically, at the age of 16, decided I was going to be an atheist. I was going to stop believing in God. God wasn't real. And my little sister begged me, bugged me, come to church, come to church. And for months, so I told my girlfriend, look, we're going to get her off our back. We're going to go one time. And I will never forget this man stepping foot in that church, January 12th, 2011, saying this will be the last time I ever step foot in a church again. And again, I apologize if I get emotional at all, but it's like, it's just so fresh in my mind. And I walked through the door that church in my mind going, I'm never coming to church again. I sat in the very back where they rope it off. I mean, this is how far I was just for those that are new to get a picture. I was making sexual references about the pa the pastor's wife on stage who was a worship leader. I mean, I was out there just in darkness, had no regard, no respect, no revere for God. And uh, the preacher preached a message about world missions, which is like totally wasn't even relevant to me. And I felt something drawing me to the altar. I didn't know that the Bible says that no one comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws them. But the Holy Spirit was drawing me to that altar. For me, it was like someone pulling on my shirt. And I went to that altar. And basically, I said, God, I don't effing believe in you. And I didn't have the words to say. I didn't have, again, respect for God. I said, but if you are real, I'll do anything. I'll, I'll break up my girlfriend. I'll move out of state. I'll travel. Like, I just started making all these crazy claims. And, you know, the audible voice of God came, said, Isaiah, I have a plan for you. I don't want 99.9% .9 of you radically changed my life. I started speaking in tongues. I didn't even know what tongues was. I had heard it one time as a kid, my parents praying it, but I'm speaking in this unknown language. I'm trying to cover my mouth because I'm like, this is crazy. My girlfriend's going to think I'm crazy. I think I'm crazy and I'm crying and just God totally radically. And, and again, I, for the sake of time, God radically transformed my life. I didn't sleep for three days. I didn't eat for two weeks. And uh, just a revival started in my home within four or five months. We had you know, four to 500 people coming, my old friends, my family. I mean, it felt like everybody was getting saved. It felt like my, well, my whole family got saved. My brothers, my sister, my sisters, my brother, uh, cousins, uncles, aunts. I mean, a real organic revival broke out in my home with our family. And uh, we just started preaching and sharing my testimony and didn't know a lot of stuff. I mean, I was just so new to it all. My uncle who was in ministry 30 years came and, and, really was an overseer for me, helped disciple me, helped train me, helped teach me. I ended up going to Bible college. I have a bachelor's degree in theology and this journey started. So a year later, we moved into a building. Then we moved into another building. And for about a month shy of 10 years, I senior pastored that revival church. That was a Tuesday night service. Well, at the meantime, I was traveling three weekends out of the month, about 150,000 miles a year throughout the U.S., preaching and teaching at, at churches, basically. And a lot of, you know, just everything you can think of from charismatic to Pentecostal to non-denominational to one, you know, Baptist. I mean, from all over the place, I started preaching and traveling. And then in 2019, um, towards the end of 2019, I started, God started telling me, hey, I want you to go online. I want you to stream. It was like three months of God speaking this to me. And I said, okay, I don't really want to. I don't desire to, but I told my pastor and my uncle as well, hey, I feel like God is saying this. And he said, man, I felt God saying the same thing. And so I started doing online January of 2020. At the end of 2019, I started buying equipment, getting a studio going, all that, and then started live streaming, of course, not knowing about COVID, not knowing none of this. I, I could share a little bit later of a word that I gave in 2019 about 2020. But again, God just totally radically um, launched our ministry online. And so January we're online in my mind, I'm going like, why am I doing this? Why am I preaching to a camera? I'm out of my comfort zone. I don't want to do this. If you know me, I've never wanted to be on a stage. I've never wanted a mic to this day. I would be happier just cleaning bathrooms and living in the church sound booth. I mean, I literally say, say this with all sincerity. I have zero desire to be public figure, to be known, to be famous. I get zero pleasure out of views, numbers, following. Um, to me, man, I wanna see people experience the power of God. I wanna see the gospel of Jesus Christ go into all the nations. And from what God spoke to me 11 years ago, I'm living out today. I've been married for going on 10 years this year. I have four children. I'm passionate for God. I'm a homebody. I'm a, I'm a dad, like a real dad. Like I change diapers. I vacuum my happy places with my kids. And so for me, family's big for me. I, I live stream full time. I'm also part of a local church out here that I preach at regularly. I'm under spiritual covering. I'm a big part of that local church. Um, I'm no longer senior pastoring because I felt like to do this full time, I couldn't be a healthy senior pastor and put out videos every single day like God was telling me Good call. what I needed to do online. And so I decided, hey, instead of just trying to be a pastor and survive while doing live streaming, while doing, I'm going to sit that, sit down from that, be a part of a local church, submit to a pastor, which I am submitted to several pastors, be a part of that local church, help that church however I can and um, preach there in whatever extent I can, but full-time being obedient to God 
to doing the live streaming. And by the grace of God, we're reaching two to three million a week through Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, um, Spotify, Google Play. I mean, it's all, it's, I'm telling you, it's all God. I, I wish I could sit here and say, I did this or I did this, but it's only by the grace of God. It's all about God. It's not the Isaiah Saldivar show. For me, it's like the less people can see me, the better. And so that's kind of been my goal and my vision is just continuing to preach the gospel. I'm passionate about deliverance, obviously. I'm passionate about signs and wonders. I'm passionate Amen. about seeing believers get out of that apathy, that complacency, that religious religious Christianity where it's, I just fill up a chair on Sunday morning. Like I did that growing up and that's why I'm so passionate is I was raised in church, but you can be raised in church and not raised in Christ. And so this is kind of the appeal I've always made. Some of my favorite preachers, David Wilkerson, Leonard Ravenhill. So like I'm a revivalist at heart. Um, it was only until August, 2020, I started really preaching about deliverance, which I could share that later if you guys want as well. But for me, I'm big on holiness. If you've listened to me, I'm big on repentance. I'm big on revival. I'm big on going back to your first love, getting in prayer. Um, these are the things that I'm very, very passionate about. Deliverance is a thing that I started teaching in August of 2020 more, more depth into. Throughout the 10 years, I've believed in it. I've cast out demons. You know, three days after getting saved, I was casting out demons. I, I've always believed it, but it's been as of recent. I feel like God was saying, train up the church, teach this. There's not enough people doing this, as you guys know. So that's kind of where I'm at. I probably missed some stuff, but just for the sake of time, I'm just excited to be here, man. I'm passionate about God. I'm passionate about the people of God. And all those people said, hey, the fire's gonna die, brother. You know, you're gonna settle down. The passion that you preach with when you first get saved, I could stand here 11 years later saying, I'm more passionate today than I've ever been. I'm more in love with God. I wake up, he's the first thing I think about. He's the last thing I think about. This is all I do. To me, it's like 24 seven. I've given my life to this. All we talk about is God. All I think about oh, is God. We're all having a I praise am, break over here. Man, Michael's I'm raising his hands man. in worship. I, I, He's ready to take the altar call. I didn't know I'm you were going to put the camera man. on me. Dude, I'm addicted, man. worshiping in response to your words. No, man, I'm addicted to the you presence have a, of God. an insane uh, exhortational gift, man. Like, yeah. you you stoked the fires. You you really are a revivalist. I'm over here getting revived. Amen. <laughs> Down I appreciate in the it, man. Right no, that, that's my I, heart, man. I'm just super passionate about it. Um, I went from drinking four loco and drinking and partying every day to prayer meetings. I mean, we were having, man, 24 hour prayer meetings. Prayer didn't stop. It was just nonstop. I was praying eight to 10 hours a day. It's just that radical fire that God has. And I've, I've always just been like, man, I want that. I want God for real. And again, I, I fight emotions talking about it because it's so real to me. God is not something that I, I know in theory. It's not, it's like Job. He's like, I heard about you, but now my eyes. I see you. Isaiah yeah. said, man, I'm, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And so I feel like that's where I want to stay. Even coming on today, like I tell people, I don't mind any criticism, any questions. Like I had a call today and I haven't even told my audience this, which this will be a whole nother thing, but I didn't almost in, you know, 45 minute call today with a pastor who I consider a father about my video on tithing. And he said, Hey, by the way, that video had about 70,000 views. It was doing really good on the algorithm, but he said, Hey, this could bring some confusion. Let me show you why let's go to Hebrew seven. And listen, I sat there listening from a spiritual father saying, you're right, I'm wrong. And about an hour and a half ago, I took down the video and I'll explain why this weekend. But my point is, I've always wanted to stay in a place of humility saying, I don't know it all. When it comes to deliverance and prophecy, I don't know it all. And if, if you've ever watched my stuff, I always say that like, hey, one thing I know about guys that are, I would say religious or they're critical about these ministries is they always know it all. They'll yeah. never say, well, maybe I'm wrong. They're always like, this is what it is. Deliverance is not for today. Christians can have demons. They give definitive statements. For me, I'm like, hey, maybe there's something I don't know. Maybe I was wrong about this. Maybe I need to go back in. So I'm always doing this, whether it's trivial, the pre-trib or post-trib or tithing or whatever it could be, as long as they're non-salvation issues, those are non-negotiable. You're not gonna debate that, right? The divinity of Christ, the resurrection, these, are not, these aren't arguments. But when it comes to these things like, is this really a spirit? or is it pre-trib or post-trib? I think we need to stay humble and yeah. teachable and say, hey, maybe you guys know more about this than I do, or maybe I know more than you guys or whatever it could be. And then just really collabing, learning together. So I'm well, excited to We're gonna to say that. that all of those areas are crazy tertiary. Like you said, we we will agree with the scriptures uh, that they're the authority for a, a Christian. We believe in the Trinity, the gifts of the spirit. We both agree on death, burial, resurrection. You preach against sin. All of these areas we look at and we say yes and amen. And in fact, I would say that we have something to learn in that space of passion and zeal. When I listen to your videos, I glean from that. Uh, it, Michael was over there praising and worshiping just now. So so obviously we can... we. We glean from these areas, and and I think that even in 
having this conversation, uh, we are not saying, hey, you got this wrong, you know, repent of this. We're saying, hey, if this is our perception of this. We actually want to extend charitable brother love and say, this is a Christian. We've always said that in all of our videos of you and say, hey, uh, we want you to give you an opportunity to respond to these so that it doesn't look like we're against Isaiah as much as it is, hey, this is an area of disagreement. And I think real Christian unity for people who've been living on the internet Christian unity looks like let's not talk about things that we disagree with. I actually think that that's really displaying Christian unity and how to strive Good. for the bond of peace, to put out something we disagree with. And let's let's kind of like wrestle over this together in love and charity. And like you said, these are tertiary issues. This isn't a salvation thing. No one's being labeled a false prophet or a false teacher. These are... Me and Michael were on the show yesterday disagreeing about Calvinism, okay, publicly. Uh, th this is what brothers do. It's a good thing. Michael, I see your hand there on the mute button. Let me toss it over to you. Oh, well, yeah, sure. I, I thought maybe, Isaiah, we could have you share about your, your word pre-COVID that was basically about COVID and some of the aftermath of that, because that's actually what sort of puts you on the radar for us. For us, that's what right. What got us even listening to you, because I think I remember right, Josh, that of the words that we tested for uh, for going into 2020 or as after 20, whatever it was. It was the 2020 was prophecy, the, yeah. Yeah, this was one of the words you're like, wow, that that looks uh, pretty much right. Let me, so, let me give the reason why we didn't share that, though. The reason we didn't, we yeah. did a 2020 prophecy video where we did eight hours of prophetic words that we we, wow. we weighed and watched for eight hours. And we we had Dr. Michael Brown, Sam Storms, Craig Keener, Ken Fish, um, uh, uh, Mike Winger, all these guys from, from di all charismatics, all believe in the gifts, came on and weighed these things with us. The only reason we didn't share that clip of Isaiah was because I didn't have the whole video and I couldn't find it anywhere. Uh, and I didn't know if it was just one prophetic word amongst 30 other things stated. And we've done that before where we, we watched just a clip and turns out there was a lot more to that clip. Uh, so that's the only reason we didn't share it. And you and I, you just had told me about where this had taken place and how I could find the video in a call that we had recently. Um, but, but yeah, give us, give us, like Michael said, give us some of the, the insight on that word. Do you want to repeat that question, Michael? I, I feel like I've, I distracted yeah, you. I got question. you. I think, yeah, I think just give us the setup for that because we can get into the stuff that we uh, we're a little bit critical toward and you can respond. We'll dialogue about it, maybe learn from each other. But before that, maybe we can start out with just this word. You had a big word about COVID. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, so I do every year this prophetic conference. I've done it for like, I'd say nine years. And you know, there's people there that give these word of the Lords, like Cindy Jacobs preaches at it. Bill Hammond preaches at it. Kent Christmas has been there every year for like 15 years. And so I was they want me to give the word of the Lord. Now I'm the guy, I every year would get up and just preach repentance. I'm like, look, I don't have a word other than everybody needs to get right with God. Like if we're not, if we're playing games with God, we're, we're messing around. So that's always been every year. And they're kind of like, all right, Isaiah's gonna get up and preach. And it's not like they're like share, I would have an hour, right? To preach and give a message. And my message was always, this is the year to get back to God to repent. Well, this specifically in 2019, God had been giving me a real word. I felt like God was giving me a word. So I got up there. This is on my page about a three minute segment. And it really was three to five minutes. It wasn't this long, elaborate word, but basically for three to five minutes, and I can send you guys a full clip later. I basically said, and this is on record on the page from December, 2019. I basically said 2020 would be the year of internet revival and living room revival. I talked about that God was gonna invade through the televisions into every living room and that there was gonna be some type of shutdown and that God was gonna reach people through online on the internet well at a mega church you know that seats about six thousand people that's like not the most popular word to say god's gonna bring house revival no god's doubt. gonna bring internet revival and everybody <laughs> else if you guys remember for 2020 what were they saying this is the year of clear vision 2020 vision when in my <laughs> yeah. mind i'm like that's as generic as it possibly gets right like 2020 2020 vision so i give this word it wasn't like anybody wasn't no one was saying like that's the word of the lord i was kind of like eh, that was all right like i think you missed it and i had pastors calling me messaging me hey brother i think you missed it you know you're talking about house revival living room revival like i don't know what about the church and that was only for the book of acts and now there's an established church you guys have heard the argument so i felt kind of like I don't know, Lord, did I miss it? But I knew God was speaking that to me. I felt that's what God was doing in the body of Christ. And I felt so much that I spent, you know, 20,000 plus dollars on camera gear and equipment to do this. So I started January, 2020, going through that, living out that word. Hey, I'm gonna live stream in the living rooms. We had this whole thing called the living room movement, living room um, revival, this whole thing from the prophetic word. March comes around, 
everything shuts down. And within three months, it went from, you know, hey, I don't know if that word's right to now every single person is in their living room online, in their couch, watching church for pretty much most of 2020. And so God vindicated in the sense that a lot of these pastors that thought I was crazy, called me back, hey man, you had it. You were the only one we can actually think of or named. Again, not claiming to be a prophet. Guys, I've literally given two public prophetic words in 11 years. So I wanna make sure that people don't think I'm giving out words every other video. Um, but they said, hey, out of all the people we've looked at, you're the only one that said that there was gonna be an internet revival, a living room revival and gave some type of language. Now I didn't prophesy that there was gonna be a pandemic and a flu, a sickness. But there are other clips of me in the middle of the year saying we're coming into a great storm in 2020. The church is not prepared. There's gonna be a great shutdown. And I have those clips as well I can find. But again, the point was, it was just a very simple word, internet and living room, internet. And I kept saying it over and over. Anyone that follows the page saw that. I was saying this over and over and, and it happened. So I felt like, man, God really gave me a real word. And then coming into 2020, I prayed and I felt like, Again, now let me just make something clear for all those that are watching. You know, I know that I could see there's 540 people watching. When I prophesy, I oftentimes say, I feel this because I don't know 100% like this is thus say it the Lord. You know, I don't speak King James when I prophesy. I believe <laughs> prophecy is an interpretation of what God is saying, not a translation. So we're not doing word for word King James Amen. when we prophesy, but we're getting the general idea of what the Spirit's saying and then fallible humans are trying to relate that word, right? Prophecy is like words from God, it's super simple. Yeah. And so I felt like in the end of 2020, that God was giving me a word for the year. I, I knew I had this platform and these people following me. And so I said, okay, let me sit down, let me pray. And this is what it came from. And let me write down what I felt God is saying. Now we could go into that and talk about all the stuff that I said and whether it happened or not. And what do I think about it? But in my mind, I said, let me just jot down the ideas of what I feel God is doing. I wasn't in my mind, and this is kind of just, I guess, what, we will, what we're talking about today. It wasn't like, let me predict events. I, I didn't really have a predictive mindset trying to predict an event or this is going to happen in 30 days or anything like that. I just thought, what could I do to encourage the body of Christ, encourage the church? What do I feel God is saying to highlight this year specifically? And then I was going to do that. But again, we could talk about some of the criticism you guys had towards it, of it being general, it being vague. That's where that came from. I did send it to my pastor. Um, and he looked at it, said, yeah, I feel this is God. And he posted it even on his page. And then I, I released that word as well. So I know one of your guys' concerns was, did a pastor even look at this? Was there an elder? There was. Again, I'm glad we're doing this today because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about me. I think there's a lot of confusion about me because people see that I talk fast and I'm loud. And so they're like, oh, he must not be educated because he talks too fast to you know be educated. But I'm glad that we can get on here bring some clarity, answer some criticism about, you know, some of the things I gave and some of the things I said, but that's kind of the only two words I've ever given. I have 700 videos you're, and I've only given two words. So just got more education of, in ministry than any of us in that none of us have a seminary degree of any kind. So like you said, you had a bachelor. <laughs> so, hey, listen, I'll say you're, this though. You're okay. <laughs> my bachelor's degree has never healed the sick. It's never cast out a demon. I've never laid it on a person. So hey, it's well a to me. I only, I only say yeah, what I gotta, done. you know, you know Neither is mean? my finance degree. I heard that. <laughs> uh, I also have so, a degree in law enforcement, but let, hey. me, let me preface with this, Isaiah, because I just want to make sure that our audience knows that we, we did give a criticism to your word, and it wasn't because we're critical of prophecy or critical of Isaiah. It's because we actually love prophecy. We love it so much, in fact, that we don't want anything that's negative out there in the prophetic to discredit mm. what we actually value and believe in. And so that's actually what we did the video is we we love this gift and we want to see we've personally been blessed by it and we've seen it bless others and we want that to be uh, more widely accepted amongst the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. Yeah, that that's good Miller. In fact, 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 5 19 to 22 which Josh referenced earlier when it tells us to test prophecies, it tells us that in the context of don't despise prophecy and don't put out the spirit's fire. And the point is it what I have witnessed and what I think Paul is addressing in that text is if we don't test prophecy, people begin to despise it. And I think that's happened a lot mm. in the charismatic movement is people just throw out prophecy, throw out prophecy. 2020 is this going to happen? 2021, that's yeah. going to happen. And they do this year after year after year. And what happens is the prophets aren't accountable. Nobody's testing it. And so what I see is people begin to despise prophecy. They don't want to do it. You have to convince them, hey, this is actually a good thing. Well, it's not a good thing because I had a bad experience with it. Nobody ever tested it. And this didn't this didn't happen and this was wrong and nobody ever said they were sorry. And so, you know, somebody 
you know, I, I could think of a prophet who predicted some stock market crash in such and such year and somebody who sold everything and, it, you know, and made financial decisions because of this. And, and uh, there's no apology. There's no repercussions. And so we have this sort of people running willy nilly, just throwing prophecies out there. And it's actually our love and affection for prophecy uh, and, and desire to be obedient to the scripture why we're doing this. But um, why don't we jump into Isaiah, your 2021 word, and we gave a review of this. I, I'm just going to uh, Josh, how about this? What do you think? I'm gonna, I'm just gonna read through really quickly what the word was, yeah. and uh, and then Josh and Miller, maybe you could kind of feed in what some of our uh, critiques were of the word, and we'll just kind of uh, run through the conversation like that. So, uh, for the 2021 prophetic word, you prophesied a year of restitution and restoration that. Uh, that God's going to restore what the devil stole, that God is removing of the lampstands of churches that don't change. He's going to expose false prophets and pastors. There's going to be a cleansing of the prophetic movement, uh, that ministers in secret sin will be exposed and stripped of their anointing, that false churches will never recover from COVID, and the real bride will begin to manifest in growth and power. There will be a reigniting of passion for those uh uh, for those who are confused and apathetic, that uh, that God is doing, uh, giving new strategies and ideas for uh, for ministry, and uh, don't persecute the new thing that God is doing. God is going to raise up the most influential celebrities and people of influence. They're going to get saved, and the church is not going to reject. Uh, the church must not reject these celebrities. A new age movement revival is going to hit the newspapers. We need to be aware of. I'm raising up a new breed of Christian special forces. Uh, you, you felt like the Lord was saying, and uh, He's calling His church to expose darkness, not to conceal darkness. Things are going to get worse before they get better. There's going to be major law changes globally. A persecution uh, breaking out against the church. Prodigals are going to come home. Uh, deliverance. Uh, there's going to be a revival of deliverance, the casting out of demons, exposing the strategies of Satan, a transfer of wealth from the wicked to the righteous, and some of the church. Uh, I don't know what that last one says. Anyway, Isaiah, how, first of all, Isaiah, how did I do at talking as fast as you? I was, I was about <laughs> to say, you, you did the hey, delivery did, all was, wrong. The delivery was all wrong, bro. They need the speed no, and the bad. volume. It just, it I was think not... the only thing was I didn't say newspapers. I said headlines. But other than that, oh, everything headlines. sounded really, yeah. Newspapers, yeah, right. like, what's a newspaper? But everything, <laughs> everything, no, man, it's not easy to talk fast, but it's, uh, it's how I've always been. In fact, I'll say I'm slow now. I used to talk way faster. I have to intentionally slow down because people say we don't understand you you talk too fast but hey i'm italian and hispanic so get over it yeah man there's this thing on youtube <laughs> for, for everybody who's listening you hit that little gear icon you can speed down or slow up any video so uh yeah, maybe you maybe you're just uh, not listening with the right medium let, let me ask you this before you before you hear any kind of critique from us before we kind of toss anything your way thinking about this word meditating on this word would you would what have you have done anything differently like what do you think about this prophetic word that you've released w would you have done anything differently would have you changed anything just let's just start there first and foremost yeah so i think hindsight is 2020 with anything um for this word again i said i prayed and wrote it down what i would have done different if i was going to go back and give this word again right or not release it and wait some time I would have definitely prayed into these topics more and been more concise and not as general saying this because I think a lot I think all of these things are something that God desires to do every single year. I just felt like these are things that God is highlighting, which we could talk about. Did some of them come to pass? Did they all come to pass and all that stuff after? But for me, I guess the biggest thing I would do if I did this again, I didn't do it this year, but if I did it again, would really say, OK, let me take some of these things, flesh them out more and say, how could I be more concise and more accurate so that it could be judged. I guess it would be easier to judge it. Now, I will say though about prophecy is I one thing I would, I wouldn't push back, but I would say that you guys, maybe, maybe you did. I didn't watch the full video just to be honest, is that um, prophecy in the New Testament is not always predictive. Like I've, I, know, I know you guys believe that you guys teach that first Corinthians 4, uh, 14, three, one who prophesies strengthen others, encourages and comforts them. So prophecy, again, it encourages, it strengthens, it builds people up, it comforts. It's not always um, predictive in nature. So I would say there are a lot of elements where it's like, oh, prodigals are coming home, revival in the home. Now, if I said that, is it predictive in nature? It can be, but it also can be an encouragement. Hey, listen, if you've been praying for your prodigal, this could be the year I believe God is bringing them. There's revival happening in homes, which 
we're getting messages at an unprecedented level of people saying, my entire family got saved. Just like what happened to you in 2011, we're seeing that. We're seeing revival in our garage. We're seeing revival in our living room. We're, you know, we're seeing God move. And so I think it did, I think that did happen. But again, could we concisively say that's something that God did? Well, yeah, God does that every year. But I think for that, for example, that portion would be more of encouraging than it would be predictive. So that's where I would say, I think I would change. I would try to be more concise going forward, looking at your guys' critique and saying, okay, maybe this came off as way too general and way too vague and broad. Maybe I should hone in on this more, be a little bit more specific, and maybe only focus on the parts where I feel are very specific. Or maybe I could have, and this is something you guys might be able to give me advice on. Maybe I could have said, hey, this portion, this portion is prophetic in nature, but it's more of an encouragement. And then this portion is more of a predictive prophetic word I want to give. And then I think if I would have broken down, it would have been more room for people to say, oh, he's encouraging here. He's exhorting here. He's comforting people here. And then over here, he's predicting, hey, our minister is going to be exposed. Well, I mean, we saw Carl Lentz. We saw Ravi Zacharias. Some of the most influential leaders Brian Houston get exposed last year. So I think that did to an extent come to pass as well. But again, I think breaking it down and I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on it, but I think putting them in categories could have been beneficial. Yeah, there's somebody put on the uh, chat section, uh, back paddling. I, I disagree with that. I think he's actually honestly evaluating a word that he gave and learning from it, which is what we want for all of us. So it takes a lot of humility to come out at somebody's show and say, yeah, I regret this. So I, I commend you for that. Um, I think- And yeah, uh, if I was backpedaling, I would have deleted it. For sure. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, just it off the yeah, come on. That's just not, that's not a fair uh, criticism. Um, so you've already said this, that you wish that it, it had been more specific, less vague. It's not always a foretelling. We're actually completely in agreement on that. Um, and I, I don't really have anything else to push back on. That's really That was really my, my ba major uh, beef with it all. Um, but I would say like one of the things that we're endeavoring to do, Michael Roundtree and I are going to be in Orlando, Florida this weekend doing a, a conference with our mentor. He'll, he'll, he'll be, he will literally be training in prophecy, hearing God, just talking about that. And Michael and I will be demonstrating some of this stuff. Uh, and Michael's even bringing somebody who he's mentoring and training in this. And one of the things that Jack always told us, one of the things that we're always telling younger people that we're sort of raising up um, is we we don't want you to uh, give a vague word. And here's why. If you give a vague word that cannot be tested, it will actually cause people to despise prophecy. There's no way for them to approve or deny what you said. And so you're always going to look good uh, at the end of the day. Um, but if you get something wrong, well, here's the good news is taking that kind of risk allows us to know there's freedom to make mistakes. There's not going to be a major penalty for it. You just simply own it and move forward. But if you get it right, well, then everybody gets the benefit of that prophetic word being accurate. It was tested. It was so specific that we could know right then and there, is this true? And when that happens, you'll find that suddenly there's faith in the room. People are giving their lives to Jesus. People are uh, coming up for to receive prayer that were previously skeptical of it. And so um, the more uh, the more we strive for specificity, the better off I think we all are um, on, a, on a grander scale. Yeah, and that's I've, a really good point. Go ahead. I've, I've been there present when 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 Michael and Michael were with Jack, and you guys have been with Jack for it feels like twenty years. Y'all cut me off. And, if, and if, for those who don't know, Jack Deere is the one yeah, we're talking about. Yeah, so a, a theologian, pastor, author, and has uh, taught a whole lot on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So yeah, so Josh, you guys, you, you, I was with you guys in Houston a couple of times, and y'all get up and give prophetic words, and we'll all go back to the hotel afterward. And and Jack was like, "Okay, guys, what did we learn?" What about that word you missed? Like, what do you think that was? You let's pray about that. And what what, do, what about this? And and they're they're twenty years deep into this thing, and they're still you know weighing in and going. You know, I should have been more clear here, and that I interpreted that when I should have explained that, or I really shouldn't have explained what I saw. I should have just given what I thought the interpretation was. And like they're sitting there wrestling. You know, again, twenty years into it, the same way that any good pastor preaches a sermon, and then afterward, you know, stay, takes a step back and examines the labor that he put into that and gone, well, I could have tied this illustration in better. And and you learn from the practice of this activity. And that's a good thing. So Isaiah, it looked yeah. like you had a question there. Yeah, I the wanna... question I would have is if you're giving, you know, I've seen some words where 
you'll see somebody in prayer, for example, and God may give you a word of knowledge. Hey, this person's struggling. They're tired. They literally said, and I've had this happen to me, and I'll give you an example. Before they walked through, they said, this will be the last time I come to church. I'm just tired. I'm weary. I'm on the verge of giving up. There's a lot of people in the church at this place. I want you to go up to them and encourage them. Tell them, I see what they're doing. Keep pressing. Keep praying. God is hearing you. Don't be discouraged. That was, that's the whole word right there, right? That to me is not super specific or even predictive sure. or even that precise. It would just be, I got a word of knowledge and I'm hearing God say this. I don't know, but God is telling me to tell you to keep going. I mean, I've given this word before and I'm like, this is so not, not prophetic, right? And the person breaks down crying. And you guys, I'm sure have all had this happen to you as well. And they go, man, that was exactly what I needed to hear. I was literally just praying, Lord, I need something from you. I'm tired. I'm weary. Send me some type of sign. And then five seconds later, you tap me on the shoulder and you say, hey, God, I feel as just saying, keep going. The only reason why I would push back a little bit on the per more precise, the better is that I would say, say people watching this, get that type of word. They might say, well, it's not precise enough. I need to be more detailed. And That's I, a good I agree, especially with like words of knowledge. And I've given addresses before social last four social security. Like I believe in this, I believe God does this, but it also at times, and I, I appreciate that prophecy. Cause to me, it's like, Hey, the more precise I agree, the better. But then also when you're teaching basic I don't want to say basic Christians, that sounds terrible, but you're teaching regular Christians that are not in the office of an Ephesians 4 prophet. They're not in that prophet's office. They're just doing what I call like simple prophecy. I think starting out saying, hey, it doesn't have to be this crazy, elaborate, specific word because for some people, they look at prophecy as I could never do that. And Paul says, all of you can take turns prophesying one by one. He says, all of you can. So I, I would say, I just, I try as well to de demystify it and not make it seem like only special people can do it. it has to be this elaborate thing i don't think that's what you're saying uh michael miller but i i do think um sometimes simple I'll is powerful yeah 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 so the the when i'm what i'm talking about is on a public platform the word that we were okay gotcha gotcha the word that was given to the whole world um gotcha. when it comes to private words i'm far less concerned about that the reason why the public platform uh, it needs to be more specific is so that everybody who hears it gets edification and not just the re the singular person on the receiving end of it. Right. Gotcha. So like okay. Miller's, yeah, totally, Miller's totally got agree. this story. I thought you were talking about just prophecy, period. I thought you were just no, saying no, like, no. I should have been, gotcha. I should have specified. Gotcha. I specified. Yeah. When Miller was at a, at a conference, we were at Convergence. He gives a, oh, I don't think I was there for this event, but it was a prior Convergence. Uh, he tells a, a gentleman in the front, I think it's like, you will survive. Or like God says, you're going to make it or something like that. And um, the guy had just been praying the night before, like, will I survive? Will I make it through my divorce or something to that effect? Mm. And I'm butchering the story a little bit. Uh, it seems yeah. very <laughs> vague. Well, the, the, the idea is that the, the word seemed vague to everyone listening, but it was very specific to the individual, right? Yeah. Now, th that saying, though, when you take it back further, like, thus saith the Lord in this room of 20,000 people, I sense that someone has back pain. Not really yeah. prophecy, Everybody right? You know, yeah. like uh, the, the chairs are crazy uncomfortable. One in three people statistically have back pain, you know, so it's just like it, that's that is the kind of. So when we talk about vague, like, you know, uh, the transfer of wealth, right? Like, is there ever a season when God doesn't transfer the wealth of the wicked into the hands of the righteous? Like, no, that happens all the time. God says he does that, right? Um, when we talk about vague, you know, um, there will be major laws changing globally. Sure, but like that happens all the time. It, it's things yeah. where we go, and, and you admitted it yourself. You're like, well, it, it was probably vague in certain areas uh, that it wasn't in others. Do you think that there was anything in here um, that was expressly wrong? Do you think there was anything that you heard that was that was explicitly wrong that you were like, ah, man, I wish I would have prayed about that more, or maybe I delivered it in, in a different way that would have been clearer? Um, help us process through that. Yeah, I wouldn't say necessarily wrong because, again, I feel like God gave me this word. I don't think any of it is anti-biblical, and I don't think any of it just didn't come to pass. Like, for example, the Trump prophecies, like it was clear those didn't come to pass. <laughs> those were so, wrong. And it, and it, yeah, and if it was, I would be the first guy to be publicly like, hey, guys, I got the Trump thing wrong. I know people are going to hate me for saying that because people got mad that people apologize, but it, it is what it is. But for me, again, I think some of these were just vague and they're hard to test. But in my mind, I wasn't like, oh, people are going to be making videos and testing and stuff. I just thought, hey, this is a word I jumped on. Let me go live. Let me give this word that I feel like God is saying to the body of Christ. And, you know, I have a massive, you know, I think it has like almost 300,000 views. So it's not just going to be like another word that get, gets drowned out in YouTube. So there will be, obviously, the bigger you get, the more criticism you're going to receive. You know, there's 700 people watching. 
if there's five people that are negatively chatting right now saying Isaiah's this or Isaiah's false that, that's going to outweigh the hundreds of people that are commenting saying, man, I love this ministry. Right. I love what you guys are doing. I love the combo. Just because the negative always stands out over the positive. That's how anything happened or that's with anything in, that happens. So for me, I would say, yeah, some of these were just vague. They were hard to test. And again, if I went back, I would say again, I would try to be more precise on these. I wouldn't do this general vague word again, because even watching it back, I'm like, hey, that could have been more precise. If I'm going to say God is transferring wealth or doing this, in what, in what way do I feel God is going to do that? Is it going to be online? Is it going to be in businesses? Is it going to be through real estate? You know what I'm saying? I sure. would have been dig a little deeper. So I agree with you guys on that. Totally. I think we're in agreement on that. And then thank you, Miller, for clarifying, because I, I didn't recognize you were saying from, from the stage, corporate, a corporate word. Obviously, those watching, probably most of them know there's a difference between a corporate prophetic word and an individual prophetic word. But um, yeah, that's what I would say if I could go back. I wouldn't backpedal. I wouldn't say, oh, no, this wasn't the word of the Lord. I, I genuinely feel it was. I still feel it is. I would just say there's too, too much vagueness in some of these topics. Um, I could have cut it down and said, okay, maybe God's telling me these things, but maybe, and this is another thing, maybe they're not all to share. Maybe not every one of these were to give to the internet for 300,000 people to hear. Maybe some of these were for my own edification or my own encouragement. Or so maybe I should have spent longer time praying saying, Lord, are you sure? Is this really? Again, these are all things that we prophesy in part. We're all fallible. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I don't think anybody has the precise, perfect word. We're not over here writing canon. Guys, this is not a salvation thing. I think all of these are congruent with scripture. I think any prophetic word that's not congruent or harmonious with scripture should be completely voided out as false. But I think when there's things we just can't test, we say, hey, it's just too vague for us to know. God probably did. But I will say this, um, and, and this is not a pushback, but let me just say, I would be careful saying like, hey, did New Agers get saved? Did the occult get saved? Because I could say I had at least a thousand messages last year. We get about two to 300 messages a day on all of our platforms. And I would say just last year, at least a thousand messages of, Hey, I came out of the new age this last year through some of your videos. Hey, I came out of the occult this last year. So I would say that could be relevant. Now I'm only one guy. There could have been many That's other awesome. people. I don't know. Praise but God, I would say, yeah. man, I, I saw at least a thousand people through just messages I've read saying, Hey, I came out of the occult. I got saved from the occult. I did. I do think a lot of the elements I described are happening. We're happening as far as, let me just give another one deliverance being mainstream. I think anybody that's online or in the church, it's safe to say deliverance was talked about more in 2021 than ever before. At least every pastor I've been connected with um, has been talking about it, has been asking about it, has been even pastors that don't agree with it, have never really talked about it much, are now disagreeing with it in 2021. So there has been a mainstream when it comes to deliverance, at least like what I've seen, like, like never before. You know, let me just give you an example. Um, we added a thousand people in 2021 to our deliverance map. And that's basically a map where believers who do deliverance can go, they sign up and now they're on a map and those that need deliverance can reach out to their other brothers and sisters in their area and get delivered, baptized in the Holy Spirit, baptized in water, whatever it could be. Because the problem was people were saying, you preach on casting out devils, but there's no churches around me that will do it or pray for me. So we made this map. It's about close to 2000 people on our map right now on our website. But last year we added a thousand people. So I think that was another prophetic word coming to pass that the map that deliverance would grow would become mainstream that god would raise up what we say you know these special forces and again that's just a, a a fun way of saying people that are engaging people that are going out there preaching the gospel casting out demons healing the sick they're not sitting on the sidelines they're not just you know carnal lukewarm sitting back they're actually out engaging so again some of the stuff i would say definitively i think did come to pass but some of the stuff i guess would be too vague to um say yes or no yeah yeah, you know, I think my thoughts on this is the fact that you're on here right now and we're basically testing your word together. For me, if you do that, if you give words for 2023 or whatever, and then you come back and you test them and you review and you say, okay, guys, this was right, this was wrong, whatever, I feel way more comfortable with that. My biggest issue is with those who never totally. test their words and they never respond to the criticism when people say, hey, that thing you predicted didn't happen. Because while you were predicting there's gonna be a revival in the home, the rest of the prophets were predicting that the stadiums are gonna be filled and there's gonna be a massive revival That's right. uh, in churches. And there are gonna be lines coming out of churches. I mean, we reviewed these kinds of words and they're not accountable. So the fact that you're actually being accountable uh, for your words, man, I, I just, again, wanna commend you for that. Uh, I think if anything, you, you know, to speak into the general versus specific, 
even on a public platform, I do think there is a place for a general word. Here's an example of yours. God is removing the lampstands of churches that do not change. Okay, now that is actually just always true. We, we know that from Revelation 2, God speaks it over the church in Ephesus. I'll take away your lampstand because you've forsaken your first love. But this is one of seven churches that's paradigmatic for churches throughout all time, that churches that forsake their first love are going to yeah. have their lampstand taken away. They're going to lose their church. So we know that that's a truism. We know that that's generally true. But I think that if we looked at the statistical data, we could say, you know what, COVID actually did legit kill some churches that actually legit needed to die. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, yeah. I, I know anecdotal evidence from just around neighborhood and just churches that I see, and churches and pastors that I have known and, and churches that are being shut down. And a lot of them, to be quite honest, needed to be shut down. So I think that it's, it, it was general, but it was also true. And I, I think there can be a place for general words. At my church, we, we do prophetic ministry from the stage every Sunday and uh, uh, over individuals' lives. And some people come up and they share general words. What I tell them, what I tell our prophetic teams is I say, hey, some general words are okay, but if we give all general words, that's not okay. There needs to be like a decent mix where there's there are enough specific things in there that can be tested that gives a little more credence to the general words that we do share. And, and you know, I look at your list and I will say, I think there were some things that you were pretty specific about. And, uh, and you know, there's a decent mix. I, I think maybe if it was, like you said, Isaiah, if it was a little more concise, it's almost like there's so much, it's hard to test it all. <laughs> um, but like a little more concise and... Um, and if you come back and test it, I, you know, I feel okay about it. And that's actually what you're doing, coming back and, and, and responding to criticism. So, man, I, I've I got a question that. in yeah. that vein. Do you think that like, like you said, this is definitely a word from the Lord. Uh, and I, I think when I watched this video, I, I was thinking, man, a lot of this seems to be within the character of God. Do you think maybe that even the delivery on who it was directed to, like, I mean, I think of 2021 as a year of not just of great prodigals coming back. I actually look at it as like a huge time where people are walking away from the churches by the droves. Churches were shutting down left, right, and center. Uh, there's a huge apostasy of people, especially in the charismatic movement, who would listen to all these Trump prophecies and, well, God doesn't know the truth and why are we going to serve him? And people were walking away. There's a huge apostasy taking place. Do you think that maybe some of this word was localized for you in your context, potentially, that it was it was released to everybody, but that, like you said, you're getting thousands of messages of people coming out of the new age. I mean, I haven't heard that. I didn't see that in, in headlines, but it does seem as if it did happen, and you actually see proof of that in your own personal life. Do you think possibly these for sure words for the Lord might have been more localized? And I'm only, again, trying to be charitable here going, okay, yeah, this makes sense. We've given words before over a group, over a family, and it was actually more specific than than the broader community. Uh, what would you say to that, that maybe maybe this is more localized? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely true. I think the bottom line is if I had a thousand followers, it wouldn't even be a, it wouldn't even be an issue because you'd say, oh, he got a hundred views and that was for his hundred people. It was a, sure. it was a, you know, precise word, but because the, the audience is so large, it could seem like, man, this was a huge word for everybody. When in reality, I was like, Hey, this is what I feel like God is saying to the body of Christ, even with like celebrities, you know, I'd mentioned to you, we, we have someone that we're uh, pastoring and helping that has 10 million subscribers on YouTube and other people that are celebrities that we wouldn't just be able to say, Hey, this person got saved. Hey, this person got saved, but there is a great re uh, revival happening, even in the removing of the lampstands. You look at like, for example, Hillsong right now, you see, sure. I don't know how many of their pastors have left and they're massively losing influence right now. And because there was this scandal after this scandal, is God removing the lampstand? And we know the lampstand stand is indicative of influence, bringing light where there's darkness. Um, that was God's prophetic way of saying, hey, you're, you're no longer going to be influential. I'm going to remove that lampstand. So again, I believe some of these things, but they could be, I don't know, they could be just to a certain audience, just to certain people. But again, I think I would have categorized them a little bit better. Another thing I just want to add to think about, something that I think about when it comes to prophecy, I know, I hate to say this, but I know as like charismatics and as people that are spiritual and we're hungry for God, we always want something new to happen. In reality, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God does new Amen. things, of course, right? God reaches new people. But in general, what God wants to do is pretty much the same every year. 
God desires to save, Agreed. God Amen. desires to deliver. So there <laughs> yes. are, I feel like, yes, emphasis is like deliverance was a major emphasis, at least that I could say. Um, I have, I've preached in probably close to 500 churches. So I do have a pretty good connection with a lot of pastors throughout the country. I can't say throughout the world because I'm, I don't have a connection throughout the entire world uh, to pastors, but I would say from all my friends that I know, my pastors throughout the country, I preached in probably 35 plus states. For many of them, they were open to deliverance in 2021 like never before. And, and these other topics maybe as well. So I would just say, yeah, absolutely. I think some of these things were um, specifically God targeting, but I am leery of saying like, this is a new thing God is doing. 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 Because again, God wants to do these things every single year. And I, I was I am emphasizing on this is specifically like the new age, like the celebrities, like the pastors being exposed, like the um, the prodigals coming home, the living room revivals type of thing. So yeah, I know we can go long on that, but that's kind of um, I think I, I think we've the gist of what we've we've covered as much of the prophecy thing. Unless one of you guys want to would chime up, and we can talk about some areas of agreement when it comes to deliverance. Because uh, yeah. again, the vast majority of your videos on deliverance that we've watched, I, I think that there's a a large bit of agreement on uh, how demonic activity can oppress individuals, how we get those demonic activity out. If I had to get like a 5,000 foot view, uh, a real quick synopsis from you on how do people get demonized, right? Uh, can Christians be demonized? We'll kind of walk through some of these questions and I'll remind you them one after another. But first one you can you can tackle is how do people get demonized? We got, we got a few others in there, but, but tackle that for me real quick. And I think that there's going to be quite a bit of agreement from us with you on this subject. Yeah, so I would say demons are obviously looking for a body. They want to live inside of a body. Uh, Jesus talks about a demon coming in a house in Luke 11:24, uh, where we literally are houses that demons want to come live in. And so he, he describes, I won't go through the whole thing that he teaches, but basically demons need an open door. Uh, this idea that a demon can just jump on you randomly is not scriptural. The Bible says a curse can't land without a cause. There has to be a, a legal right or reason for a demon to enter you. For me, in my experience, any demon I've ever dealt with or cast out of somebody that talked back, which not all of them do, we could talk about that as well. They said there was a reason or there was a reason or legal right or a purpose for them being there. So yeah, demons want to come into people. They Demons of lust, they need a body to lust through. Demons of alcohol need a mouth to drink through. Demons of rage need someone to rage through, right? So they do crave a body. They are bodiless because they're spirits. Spirits don't have obviously a physical body. So they look for bodies. I would say a couple ways. Number one would be sinful acts, sinful habits. If you look at like 1 John 3, it says, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. I mean, think about this. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil's been sinning since from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So we see John connecting the practice of sinning with the devil. And that's a big major open door. Now, there's a difference between, I want to note this, the practice of sinning and sinning. Sinning one time is not practicing sin practicing sin is when you do it over and over and you get good at it and that's the point of practicing like why do i practice football why do i practice basketball it's to get good at it and people say well brother how do i know if i'm good at sin it's when you're no longer convicted it's when you're no longer wounded when it no longer hurts you to sin when there's not that not that turning that holy spirit conviction i would say that's a good indicator that you're good at sinning so when you make things uh, sins habits or they become habitual that becomes an open door in my experience for a demon to enter in if you look at matthew 6 22 the bible says the lamp is the body the lamp of the body is the eye if therefore your eye is good your whole body will be full of light one translation says your eyes are the window of your body when your eyes are good you will have the light that you need and so not only sinful habits but what people watch you know again i know i'm not out of touch with people watching right now i know there's people watching that say brother, this is crazy. A demon can't come in through a movie. A demon can't come in through entertainment. A demon can't come in through sinful habits. But again, most of the people that criticize deliverance the most are those that do it the least. So when you actually get engaged on the front lines, you start realizing, man, these are open doors. Like I had one situation, I was at a pastor's event and or a revival event, and there was a lot of pastors there. And again, this is just an experience. I'm not saying there's a verse right here that says this, but I was with some really well-known famous pastors and one of the, the leaders on the pastor staff started manifesting at the altar, was manifesting a demon, was screaming, growling, the whole thing. And we go up and start praying for her and the demon's not coming out. And one of the pastors is like, what, what spirit is this? And the demon says, Wizard of Oz. 
Now I can stop and say, I don't have a verse for that. I don't know where that's at in the Bible. Or I can be like, okay, I don't know. I'm just going to get it out of you. I don't care if it's Wizard of Oz. I don't care if it's Harry Potter. It doesn't matter to me. What matters is we're going to get it out of you. And goes on to say, after the girl got delivered, we asked her about it. The pastor who was her pastor said, that was so weird. The spirit's name was Wizard of Oz. Like that's weird. That How is that a spirit? And the girl said, what's crazy is, Growing up, she had gone through some abuse and some other things, and she used to watch The Wizard of Oz, and she would get in the corner of her room when she had gone through some abuse and some situation she went through, and she would rock back and forth saying, there's no place like home, there's no place like home, and she had decorated her entire house in Wizard of Oz. This is a grown lady I'm talking about. And the pastor said, and she said that her whole house was decorated Wizard of Oz, her kids were there. Anyways, it was this whole testimony of The Wizard of Oz. And so I'm not gonna go make a video on the Wizard of Oz spirit. <laughs> Praise what is God. it safe to say that this girl in her own way said, man, this must've come in through my addiction to sure. and my obsession with the Wizard of Oz, right? So these are things where it's like, we don't have necessary verbiage for or necessary verses for, but they are real realities. So that's the thing, watching things we're doing, occult practices, obviously like fortune telling, astrology, yoga, Ouija board, sorcery, divination, ritual ceremonies, pretty much any occult practice you can think of as an open door to demons. One thing I'll add, and the last thing I'll say that I commonly as an open door is trauma and abuse. And this is something that I think isn't talked about a lot, but many times demons come in, not always because of what you did, but also what's been done to you. And then I know the chat, everyone watching is saying, brother, that's not fair. How could a demon come in when someone did something to me? And the answer is the devil's not fair. Show me one place in the that's Bible right. the devil's fair when he's out killing people, murdering babies and everything else that he's doing in our culture. So yeah, I've dealt with hundreds of people that have had demons through sexual abuse, mental abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse. Um, I had one girl who was a, the, uh, a youth pastor's wife that we dealt with. The demon said I came in when she was eight years old, her mom punched her in the face and that's when I entered her and I've been here since she was eight. We weren't asking the demon for the information. We weren't saying, when did you come in? What are you doing? The demon voluntarily spoke out of her and said, I came into her at eight years old when her mom punched her and beat her. So again, these are a lot of the ways these demons could enter. Are there other ways? Probably. Are there other situations? Of course there are. But for me, I don't think we need an exhaustive list. I think that um, these are some of the major ways that they come in and, and it's real. Uh, I think that guys that preach against this, and again, not throwing shade at anybody in the chat or any pastor watching, I would just say you're out of touch. You're out of touch with people that are really hurting. I sit with people, I talk to people on a weekly, on a daily basis that are hurting, that are broken, that are really dealing with a voice telling them, just take your life. Nobody cares, nobody loves you. And they sit there contemplating suicide. I deal with people that are addicted that say, Isaiah, I wanna give this up so bad, but there's something talking and living in me that's drawing me to this. I'm not talking about the flesh. So these are real people hurting and broken. And if you're not a pastor or leader in this world, in this, um, in this world of deliverance or this realm of casting out demons, which we know Jesus did, the disciples did, they did it in the book of Acts, then you could easily get out of touch and say, oh, that's not a demon, that's not a demon, that's not an open door. But when you're like down in the dirt with some of these people that are really broken, you start realizing, man, these people are really hurting and these things are open doors. And uh, I got the answer, man. I got the Holy Spirit. I got the power man. of God. I have a, the authority Jesus has given me. And so, yeah, those are some ways. Dude, I, I love what you said about uh, you're not going to take this experience and turn it into uh, some kind of Bible teaching about how to cast out demons. You got to cast out the Wizard of Oz spirit or something like that. Uh, because that's been one of the major issues that we've routinely criticized when it comes to deliverance teachers is they say, well, I experienced this, and then they make it a paradigm for every believer everywhere that this is how you, you cast out demons. And for us, we look at that and we say, man, that's endangering the doctrine of sufficiency of Scripture. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training of righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Scriptures give us everything that we need for life and godliness, everything that we need for being thoroughly equipped in every good work. And if there are secret tactics to casting out demons that aren't in the Scripture, and I need to follow such and such teacher in order to find those secret tactics, that's where we start to enter into this territory of endangering uh, sufficiency of Scripture. So I, I love that you said that, uh, and I, I've experienced the same thing with uh, casting out of demons. Some 
the the demon will say some weird thing it, it'll identify itself in some way you know we did our episode on the jezebel spirit you guys in the chat can go back and watch our jezebel spirit episode and and we talked about is there scriptural support for this we looked at revelation 2 we looked at jezebel in the old testament etc and um and, and you know we we came to the conclusion that you can't definitively say that there is a jezebel spirit now that was our conclusion and uh but we also said it doesn't mean there's not a jezebel spirit or a jezebel or a spirit certainly there are spirits that cause people to do jezebel like things uh do we call it a jezebel spirit well i had a a, a congregation member come up to me after that episode and she said i was casting out a spirit once i said what's your name and it said jezebel <laughs> she's like what do you what do you think i should have done i said i would have told jezebel to go and she said but you said the jezebel spirit's not real i said i didn't say it's not real no, you would have told the I two eunuchs to cast jezebel down so the dogs could eat the spirit <laughs> oh and poop and it all blood. over israel you can always count on josh there but um <laughs> any anyway th there's a difference in my mind between what we experience uh, just in interpersonal uh, situations and we're casting out demons. I'm not going to go ahead and turn that into a teaching. A and maybe this can can transition a little bit into our conversation about the Leviathan spirit. And I can't remember if we crit criticized anything you said about a Jezebel spirit or not, to be quite honest, uh, Isaiah. But but that is where you know, we didn't we didn't see evidence in the Bible that there is for sure a Leviathan spirit that does these things, or there's for sure a Jezebel spirit that does yeah. these things. Let me let me toss it over to Miller real quick. He's got to catch a plane, so he wants to say bye to everybody. Yeah, well, I just I love the 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 conversation, Isaiah. Super thankful to get to meet you. I would love to connect in the future, uh, and I, I would honestly love to do an episode with you where we just swap war stories of casting out demons. Let's do I it again, I, man. I'm down. Yeah. That would be a lot of fun. Uh, and, and just so you know, I've cast out demons with a name like Jezebel or something like that, though I would never make it a, a teaching. Uh, but I've seen it happen multiple times where something will tell me its name and I'm going, OK, let's cast out a spirit that of Moloch. I, I had that happen uh, actually about three months ago where something was calling itself by an ancient Canaanite deity. And I'm going, OK, let's deal with it. Um, but I didn't see that uh, particular demon in the scriptures. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Did you, I, did you I would love turn to around and write future. a book about it and, and turn it into yeah. this mainstream Christian teaching? I will. And I'll know and, Malek's name. And we'll get and our, our common friend to publish it. <laughs> oh, boy. That was a low blow. Cheap shot. Okay. <laughs> Cheap shot. Uh, Michael. Inside uh, you guys. Love you yeah. guys. Gotta See you, go. Miller. God bless, yeah. man. Great to meet Ra you. Yeah. Roundtree, just going to toss it back to you, man. Finish up that statement. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So uh, maybe we can jump to. Uh, the conversation about the Leviathan spirit specifically, because we're we're starting to get into the demonic and and we did just like we did an episode on the Jezebel spirit. We did an episode on the Leviathan spirit. We looked at the references to the Leviathan in scripture. You guys can go back and watch it. And, but basically, we came to a similar sort of conclusion. Uh, we said there might be a Leviathan spirit. We didn't think we could definitively say it from scripture. Wasn't that our, Josh, am I missing yeah, anything on so that? So actually the Leviathan, I think that we both agreed that the Leviathan spirit might actually be Satan himself. Um, uh, we, yeah, we kind of the Isaiah 27 Beale reference. Some other content, yeah. The Isaiah 27, and it might be Isaiah 26. Uh, Isaiah 26 or 7, the first one or two verses there. Yeah, mentions the Leviathan spirit, and uh, and it seems like that, that that's actually talking about the devil himself because of the way Revelation twelve alludes to that passage. But uh, but whether there's a Leviathan spirit that um, it, it fits the description in many charismatic teachings, we kind of had some doubt about that. Isaiah, here's here's what you said about the Leviathan spirit. That um, so Leviathan is a spirit. It's a marine spirit. It wants to shipwreck your faith, your marriage, your ministry, your prayer life. It twists the truth uh, because Leviathan means twisted serpent. So it was Isaiah 27, 1. Uh, Leviathan is a covenant breaker. He'll uh, And it twists your words and serpent means to whisper a magic spell. And so we, we reviewed the video and we, we felt like we couldn't really come to those conclusions exegetically because if we wanted to jump into Isaiah's mind as he's prophesying this and ask ourselves the question, is Isaiah trying to teach us about a demon named Leviathan or the references in Job? Is Job trying to teach us about a demon named Leviathan that is a covenant breaker, etc.? We thought, you know, 
we don't think that that was in, in Job's mind. We don't think that was in Isaiah's mind. We don't think that he was teaching us about a, a specific demon named Leviathan. Uh, and, and, so, and so we kind of had some pushback on that. Uh, Isaiah, as you hear me talking, what, what do you think? How, how do you come to the conclusion that Leviathan is a marine spirit? Or is there what does it even mean that it's a marine spirit? Is there anything that you would change after hearing some of these critiques? Just go yeah, ahead and so jump I in. would say, yeah, I would say something just to kind of set the stage that you guys would probably agree with is the Bible isn't exhaustive. So we're not going to find every name of every spirit, as Miller True. said, of every demon. And we're not going to go make doctrines on every single demon. Uh, just to give you an example, I have 700 videos right now on my channel, and I have two videos out of 700 that are on literal names of demons, and both of them are found in the Bible. Now, it wouldn't be, I would say, wrong to go make a video on 10 spirits of like, say, lying or lust, or these are how these spirits function. It would be extra biblical, which tons of stuff we do in the church is extra biblical. Our order of service is extra biblical. The Bible doesn't say you need to have your worship, then you need to have your offering, then the pastor gets up and preaches, then you have the altar call. But it's not wrong to do that just because it's not explicitly in scripture. Or let me just say this, there's no named pastor in scripture. And is a pastor wrong? No. Ephesians 4 tells us there is an office of the pastor. Some say elders, some say pastor, but it's not found explicitly in scripture. The word rapture, I believe in the rapture. I'm sure you guys do. It's not found explicitly, but it's a biblical reality. Um, the word Trinity, I'm Trinitarian, although the word Trinity is not in scripture. It describes a biblical reality. So I think I, I'm, I may differ with you guys in this. I don't believe something has to be explicitly Leviathan is a spirit to be able to draw from Job or Isaiah and say, how do you describe an animal being the king of all the children of pride, right? Which you guys said you think it could be the devil he's talking about. I think there's a real spirit of Leviathan, not only because I think that's what scripture alludes to, not that it says ex explicitly, but also because I've experienced it over and over. For example, I've had a lady who never knew anything about Leviathan, doesn't know anything about Jezebel, and I'm praying for her, and all of a sudden she starts speaking out, my name is Leviathan, in a man's voice. Does she know? And I asked her after, do you know Leviathan? What's Leviathan? That was her question after deliverance. What is Leviathan? So for me, I look at that and go, okay, she doesn't know what Leviathan is. She's never studied Job. She's never studied Isaiah. She's never seen any of these verses in Revelation about or Jezebel or Leviathan or whatever you say, yet she's acknowledging, or the Spirit's acknowledging its existence. Now, it's not explicitly Leviathan is a spirit, but it's not anti-biblical to say, hey, there is biblical evidence that could go either way. Like you guys said, we didn't say it wasn't a spirit, but we just don't fully know. I would take that and say, along with experience, along with dealing with the spirit over and over and over again, me personally, I could definitively say it's a spirit. It, it barks like a spirit. It talks like a spirit. <laughs> it's probably a dog, not a duck, right? Bro. That's for me personally. That's now, my favorite for thing, others, by the way. For others, and I totally said it wrong, but it's okay. I'm it's talking okay. fast. For others, they might say it's not a spirit, Isaiah, but then they might deal with it over and over for a whole year and say, okay, I used to think it wasn't, but after dealing with this for a whole year, I think it is a spirit now. As far as marine spirits, let me touch on this. Marine spirits are not a biblical category. Uh, you're not going to find the word marine spirits in the Bible, just like you're not going to find the word Ouija boards, spirit boxes, or a thousand other New Age practices. Last night, we did a video for an hour and a half with a friend who's an ex-New Ager. He's now a believer. He's on fire for God. And we did an hour and a half video on New Age practices. You know, you need to stay away from things like yoga, things like uh manifestation things like meditation on ungodly things all these practices that we've talked about Amen. Uh, yeah. lsd and shrooms and all these things that young people are opening themselves up to and we did an hour and a half video on new age practices and guess what not one of those practices is found in the bible there's no yoga in the bible there's no ouija boards in the bible there's no spirit boxes but it doesn't take them out of existence so for me i would say now let me let me preface it by saying this you don't need any of these training videos to cast out demons. Let me just say that. You don't need the books. You don't need the teachings. None of them are going to make it to where you can cast out demons. All you need is the authority Christ has already given you. I cast out demons three days after being saved, and I didn't even know anything about the Bible or the name of the 12 disciples. I didn't, couldn't even name five of them. So it's not like you have to watch Isaiah's teaching on Leviathan. you got to watch this teaching on Jezebel. You'll never be able to deal with her. The, all you need is, is the authority Christ has given you to cast out devils, right? Be proficient Amen. in scripture. Understand the Bible. 
But is it and is it bad to do it? Is it bad to teach things that are extra biblical that are incongruent or harmonious? I don't think anything I said was out of line with what the Bible teaches. I don't think it contradicted scripture. I think I drew from not only my own experiences, but what I see the Bible saying, like he's the king of the children of pride. In my mind, I'm going, okay, how could a, an animal be the king of the children of pride? And then, and then going on and on again, I won't go through the whole video because it's an hour, but looking at those different things, I think that it's clear. I believe that just because something's not in the Bible doesn't make it less valid. You know, John at the end of his uh, gospel said, hey, if everything was in the Bible, it would fill up the entire world. So there's tons of stuff that Jesus did that is not in scripture. Um, and there's tons of stuff we do in the church that's not in scripture. But hey, is it wrong? I don't think youth pastors are wrong. I don't see them in scripture, but I don't think they're wrong. I don't think the word rapture is wrong. Even though I don't see the word in scripture, it's describing a biblical reality. But I would say everybody has their own idea, their own interpretation based on how they interpret the Bible, how they know, how they, um, what their life experiences have been. And so for me, I would say, I don't just believe in it in theory, but also in practice. And that's why I would say, yeah, Leviathan is a spirit. I wouldn't recant and backpedal and say, no, it's not a spirit. It's just, you know, the devil or a sure. I mean, the Bible calls it a spirit, right? Right. He says that he calls it an evil spirit, right? So we're not, uh, I mean, I don't think in Job, it explicitly says that he's a spirit, but we do, I think, see in Isaiah 27, that there's some kind of spirit there. Let me, let me ask you a question though, um, because I, this is an important point of clarification because people heard you say, okay, it's not in the Bible. There's a lot of true things that aren't in the Bible. Okay. But we don't necessarily, so like a Roman Catholic guy might say, Hey, purgatory is not in the Bible right? But it doesn't mean it's not true or penance isn't in the Bible, but it doesn't mean it's not true. Yeah. But I would say um, purgatory is anti-biblical because the Bible teaches a heaven and a hell after death. It's agreed. appointed for man to die once, then comes judgment. So to teach there's a waiting room for the righteous that you can pay to get out of is an anti-biblical principle saying that Leviathan is a spirit because I've dealt with it or because it's, you know, there's biblical evidence to support it either way, whether it is or not. Um, just like, for example, if I said jealousy is a spirit, I've dealt with the spirit of jealousy. I believe definitively Jealousy is a spirit. I don't have a teaching on it. I don't have a verse for it, but I've dealt with the spirit of jealousy. So sure. again, like, like these things, I would say they're not anti-biblical. They don't go against scripture. They're non-essential doctrines and yeah, you don't clarify. need them. You don't have to have them, but yeah, yeah. Let me clarify. So like if, if I was to sit down next to Michael and say, Michael, teach me to preach, you know, there's no Bible verse that says this is how you preach. But Michael would say, well, yeah. Josh, you need a big idea. And then in your big idea, you need three points. And then each point needs to have an explanation, an illustration, and an application. Easy peasy, this is how you preach, okay? And that 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 is called um, a pedagogy, okay? And that pedagogy is nowhere seen explicitly in Scripture. But we've learned this is how people learn, right? So we're teaching one another on how to preach the gospel outside of an explicitly biblical text, okay? Now, so so I grant it, I'm just asking, where is that line? Because again, okay, so purgatory and, and penance is a good example. What about, yeah. you, I've, I've told you this on the phone, there's a, there's a guy out there, there's a group of individuals out there who want to integrate the demonic force uh, into the person's life, like it's a split personality, and they, they want to, the demon to get saved and confess that Jesus is Lord and, and walk through a, a process of repentance with what? the demon and integrate I've the demon. I've never heard this. This is outrageous. What? They want to integrate the demon into the person's psyche uh, and redeem the demon, right? So, but they learned this from the demon, right? And nowhere in yeah. the scriptures do we see that integration of demons and personalities are inherently wrong, right? So, so again, obviously you don't believe that. Obvi I mean, obviously, yeah. right? Again, when, when I was talking about areas of agreement, I think you and I probably agree on how people get demonized. Someone is asking me online, you know, can someone get demonized from Pokemon? Can someone demon? I just said, look, guys, you can get demonized from worshiping a chair. There's nothing demonic yeah. about the chair, but if you if you yeah. posture your heart in a way that is sinful, sin is how demons get in, right? So so if you yeah. posture your heart in such a way that this is an inappropriate relationship, you know, like 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 you said, sorcery. Yeah, certainly yoga is not in the Bible, but sorcery is, right? Uh, syncretism yeah. is, and you start practicing those things, you're gonna you're gonna get demonized. Um, so we agree on 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 get how to get demonized, whether Christians can get demonized, we agree on that. How we cast out demons, ultimately faith and repentance. At, right? We have yeah. the person repent. We have authority over the demon. We cast the demon out. So we agree on a lot of that stuff. But that line of of nuance between what is extra biblical. Yeah, so where's the line at? Yeah, yeah, Where, yeah. Where's, I would say the line is when it gets anti-biblical. So like saving a demon, the demons ha are not going to be saved. They're destined for the lake of fire in the end of Revelation. We know that they're going to be thrown in with the devil. All these spirits are going to be. So to say a 
demon could get saved is an anti-biblical principle. So when it gets anti-biblical and it goes against, and it's not no longer harmonious with scripture and it goes against the harmony of what the Bible teaches, I think that's where you get in error. Um, like if you look at scripture, for example, there's a lot of different spirits. There's evil spirits, lying spirits, deaf and dumb spirits, seducing spirits, spirits of infirmity, spirits of the antichrist, spirits of death, spirits of fear. I know all the people in the chat that don't believe this are squirming because they didn't realize these are in the Bible. They're spirits <laughs> of the children of work of disobedience. So is it a stretch to say, okay, there's a whole bunch of spirits, spirit of fear. God has not given you a spirit of fear. Why is it, why is he calling it a spirit yet? So it's not like, it's not, um, unharmonious to say that Leviathan or Jezebel or like Moloch, right. Or all these things are spirits. If you see that, okay, in the Bible, there's tons of spirits. Not everything's mentioned in the Bible. It's not exhaustive. We know you can sit down and read the whole new Testament in one sitting. I've done that several times where I've read the entire new Testament in eight hours. And again, it's not an exhaustive list of everything like to teach preaching, to do worship theory. There's no worship music teaching in the new Testament. Yet we teach at our Bible colleges how to do worship, how to write worship music. So these are things I think the line is when you get into crossing, this is anti-biblical. It goes against what scripture teaches, the orthodox doctrines of the resurrection of the divinity of Christ and all these other things. I think it's dangerous. Again, though, I want to say they're not necessary teachings. And we talked about That's a this. helpful distinction. Um, yeah, we talked about this, that look. Some most pastors, if there's say three pastors on staff and you preach once a month or once every twice a month, let's say an average pastor might preach or let's say three times a month, you have to three times a month, get a sermon that's 45 minutes long on average in America, three times a month. Just think about that. Okay. For you guys, for me, we're live streaming sometimes every day. So I'm producing content every single day. So of course, we're going to have extra time to talk about topics that a pastor doesn't have time to cover. He just doesn't have the bandwidth to be able to describe a lot of the stuff we do. If you have 700 videos on your channel, it's you're going to have a lot of time to say, okay, this is more in depth on this, or this is training for this. Is it necessary? Of course it's not. Of course you don't have to know this. And I've never claimed that. None of us claim everything's a demon. No one in my camp has ever claimed Christians could be demon possessed. All the claims that these, these people make against us are all invalid claims. Not that you guys have made, but a lot sure, of sure. these criticisms we get, they're not valid. You'll never hear me say a Christian could be possessed by a demon. You're never going to hear me say, oh, you know, this is that, or everything's a demon. Everything you do is a demonic spirit or demonic opening. We don't say that. I think that those that are against the ministry of deliverance, which is a lot of people, they want to create their own narrative to try to slander the ministry of deliverance. But for me, I would say this is Jesus's ministry. He started it. It's not, you can't separate the ministry of Christ and the ministry of deliverance. They are intertwined together. It's a ministry he started. It's part of the atonement. And um, I think it's necessary that every believer is engaging and doing these things. Now, again, people could disagree with me, but I think it's important as far as like, does it matter to know these things? Like, let me just say this. How would knowledge help in casting a demon out? I, I know you guys have said that before in your videos. That would be a question you want to ask me. To me, it helps in identifying the spirit functioning in someone's life. I mean, you look at a doctor, they, ha they have a thousand types of cancer. And imagine asking the doctor, why would knowing about all these types of cancer or a specific cancer help? Like, just treat it. Don't worry about if it's breast cancer, if it's eye cancer, if it's brain cancer. But each type of cancer does something different. And so to be able to know what's functioning or maybe whether you even need deliverance, it's good to know these things about, say, these spirits or about the way the devil functions. If you look at... Like for example, 2 Corinthians 2.11, so that Satan will not have an advantage, we must be familiar or we are familiar with his evil schemes. So Paul says, look, if you're unaware of the schemes of the devil, which we know demons fulfill the devil's schemes, then you're going to automatically be at a disadvantageous position. So yeah, I would say it is beneficial, not necessary, these are not essential doctrines that you have to have. You don't have to watch the videos, but they will help you if you want to know more, if you want to learn more, and if you want to be more proficient in spiritual warfare. I think it does help to know these things because if you're dealing with these spirits, you say, oh, okay, this is there. I know because this, and I know because this. And so you can deal with them more properly if you're, if you're in deliverance ministry. Again, though, I want to make the, the statement, not necessary, not required. They're extra biblical. They're not essential, but I still think they are important in training and equipping, just like taking a class on preaching could be important. I'm not going to make a video saying, hey, it's not in the Bible. 
there's nowhere in the Bible that tells you to teach people how to preach and how to use a three point and use illustrations and, you know, execute. every seminary on the planet no, no. uses that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm not going to sit there and say that I'm not going to make a video of that I'm just saying, hey, if that's what you do, cool. It's not anti biblical, but it is extra biblical because we're not again, just like worship. We're not taught how to do worship music. We're not told yeah. to do three fast songs, two slow songs, but I don't think there's anything wrong with it um, as long as you're not anti biblical. Yeah, uh, I think that's a it is definitely a helpful line that like in the very least, you're not going to teach anything that is anti biblical. I would maybe put out there just another line. And it's something that I mentioned earlier, and that is the sufficiency of scripture. And you actually touched on that, even though you didn't use that language, because you said, hey, it's not necessary that you have these things because you have authority in Jesus name. You can cast the demon out, whether you know its name is Leviathan, whether you know its name is Wizard of Oz or Susie Q. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You have a, you have authority in Jesus' name, but these little tactics can be helpful. Just like you know, knowing how to do a like introduction and conclusion and uh, put a, together a big idea and preaching can be helpful. But but what you did with that language, Isaiah, is you took it outside of the realm of like uh, of necessity and you put it yeah. into the realm of can be helpful. And safe in doing so, you safeguarded the doctrine of sufficiency of Scripture, which again is the Scripture gives us everything we need for life and godliness. And so, uh, and so, I think you safeguarded it in that language. But, but I think maybe just a slight pushback I would maybe uh, I would have Isaiah would be that when we when I watched your videos, it sounded like, and, and even listening to you just now, that you taught these things definitively. Uh, that, that you taught what I would put in the category of speculation or or maybe even a little stronger than a, a strong hunch. Um, but you put it into the realm of this is truth. And, and I think, you know, for me, when I'm teaching, I, I try to differentiate verbally like, okay, hey, this is Michael's opinion on this. And, and I think I have good reasons for this opinion versus this is gospel truth. Take it to the bank. And, and Isaiah, I think the reason Josh and I tend to be sensitive to that is because, uh, is because we've, we've done videos on this. I mean, I, I take the, how the many books of, have been published, but take the issue of courts of heaven. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the courts of heaven, I actually saw some people talking about it in the chat. Well, I had a lady, uh, in, in my last church, she would come up and she'd tell me these experiences of all these demons that were cast out because of the courts of heaven. And she'd have this teaching about how you got to go to court like number 492 and you got to serve these kinds of papers and you got to do all this crazy crap. I mean, I'm sorry. That's just what it was <laughs> to cast out a demon. And I thought, oh, this is heartbreaking because if you got to do all that to cast out a demon, no one's ever going to cast out demons because you have to have this crazy yep. specialized knowledge. It's not in the yeah. Bible. I mean, you, you apparently know more than Jesus and the apostle Paul. I mean, you're, you're just this incredible exorcist. And, and I just think, you see, that's where we endanger sufficiency of Scripture because we put more hoops for people to jump through in order to be able to cast out demons. Now, what I hear you saying is, well, you actually don't need it. it can be helpful, but you actually don't need it. So I'm glad to hear that. But it it seems to me that when you when you ardently and passionately teach as truth, there is a Leviathan spirit because I've experienced it, and there is a this kind of spirit because I've experienced it. I feel like we we kind of transgress that line a little bit by making it seem as though we can take to the bank this spiritual reality that's that's not explicit in the Bible. So I think my preference would be just sort of a like one thing I do when I cast out demons. I I actually and this is just a, this is a Michaelism. I look people in the eyes. I ask them to open your eyes and look at me, and I want to I'm going to address the spirit. And I've learned from experience to do this because whenever I'm casting out demons, the spirit makes the person want to look away and distract. Sometimes they'll tell like a raunchy joke or something. It's like they want to just do anything yeah. to distract from what's happening in that moment. And so I'll just say, just, I, I say, just look me in the eyes. So I've taught people in deliverance. I've said, hey, in fact, I did this last week in a, in a training. I said, hey, here's something that I do and I have found it helpful. But I clarify, this is a Michaelism. This is not a Bibleism. You don't have to do this, but if you find it helpful, you can do it. And so I, I try to differentiate that in my teaching versus when I teach like Matthew 4.23, here's the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of God's reign. And it, and it's there's preaching and then there's demonstration through healing and casting out demons. I can go to chapter and verse for that 
and, and teach it definitively that this is the expression and manifestation of gospel of kingdom because that's that's hardcore scripture explicit tie so so that that would be maybe a soft critique isaiah and i like you and i think you're doing amazing work <laughs> for the kingdom yeah. but uh and michael you'd say that like you've you've seen demons like uh, you've told me in a, in a prior dialogue that there was a spirit that came to you like my name is azazel right and we yep. each have got dozens of stories of people saying you know incubus or succubus is present which seems to be uh uh identified with some kind of sexual immorality um th these these spirits and they'll, they'll they'll say hey this is my name and we'll go hmm okay that's nice and it's st you still cast them out just the same nevertheless uh and and isaiah well, I, I hope you, I hope and, you hear us and saying to be that, fair if if someone if a demon says my name is such and such i'm going to address it by that and tell it to go in the name sure. of jesus for sure. But yeah, yeah. I only, I only meant to say that, like, you, you hear us saying that we realize that there are spirits in the world that are named that are not found in the pages of Scripture. Like, you hear us saying that we believe yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we absolutely believe that there are actually demonic spirits in the world at large right now, but we don't create, um, we don't create teachings around those things because we don't want to, we don't want to um, speak into an area authoritatively that's that's not padded by an experiential, hey, this is our experience. Yeah, and I think when we're speaking as preachers or influencers or pastors, we're not speaking with the authority of Scripture. Like, we're not definitively saying, this is what this means. And I don't know if you guys um, believe in, like, revelatory preaching. I'm sure you do. Like, if someone says, don't be like Zacchaeus and spectate the move of God, right? Or don't be like Peter and deny God at work. Like, speaking revelatory, like saying Leviathan wants to shipwreck your faith is, like, symbolic, not literal. So, like, if you look at, for example, um, 1 Timothy 1.19, says, cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. For some have deliberately, deliberately violated their conscience. As a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. So like Paul is using the word shipwreck as an illustration for what happens when you deliberately violate your conscience. He's not literally saying, hey, your faith is a literal ship and it's going to wreck. So I think too, when we teach and preach like revelatory or like we're using symbolism or examples, it could also be misconstrued as you're saying this is exactly what the Bible says, which for me, my video of Jezebel or my video of Leviathan, I didn't say there's a verse that says Leviathan's a spirit or Jezebel's a spirit. I'm saying from what I draw from scripture, this is what I believe. Now, again, you don't have to believe that. You don't have to agree with it. I'm not authoritatively saying this is what the Bible says. And we've, we talked about that earlier because the Bible doesn't authoritatively say Leviathan is a spirit. I think you said it might. I don't know an exact verse that it would or Jezebel is a spirit. I just look at the church of Revelation and say, okay, if I dealt with the spirit of Jezebel a ton of times, I look at her characteristics. I look at this church that is tolerating Jezebel. Is it a spirit this girl had? Is the girl's literal name Jezebel? I mean, so I'm drawing, okay, I would conclude. It's not authoritatively. I don't have any type of authority to write canon. Obviously, none of us are writing canon here or creating that type of doctrine. But I would say this is my conclusion. And because I'm the one, you know, speaking it or sharing it, this is what I think. Just like anything we would preach. I mean, I don't think any of us get up and preach for an hour and preach word for word, literal text of scripture and say, this is definitively. And even, even so like, for example, you guys might say, I could definitively say that the gifts are for today. I've experienced them. I see it in scripture. You guys have friends and I have friends that would turn around and say, I could definitively say the gifts of the spirit are not for today because I have this verse, this verse, and this verse. And we can go on for three, four, five hours debating are the gifts for today. And you're going to walk away and you're going to teach your audience the gifts are for today because of what I see in scripture. And they're going to teach their audience the gifts are not for today because what I see. So I think all of us to an extent are interpreting our own of how we interpret scripture and how we look at it. But again, these are not issues on salvation. These are not issues on, and they're not net, they're not needed to be able to do what the Bible commands us to do. The Bible is extremely vague on deliverance. The Bible says Jesus cast out demons, synagogue, synagogue, Mark 139, Matthew 10, he commissions the 12, Luke 10, he commissions the 72, Mark 16, all believers. If you look at Acts chapter eight, you look at uh, Philip, the evangelist casting out demons. It doesn't say how, it doesn't say how long, Acts 16. We don't know how long it took Paul to cast that demon out of the slave girl. It says within the hour, at that hour. I mean, we don't know. Was it 20 minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes? Did he say this? Did he say that? And so it leaves room for us to experience, us to teach. Jesus didn't teach them how to cast out demons when he sent them out. He said, go cast out demons. So I think it is, I think we do need to be careful, as you said, uh, Michael Roundtree, to not overcomplicate it. I have had, I went from having a 10 step, hey, these are the 10 easy steps to casting out demons, to seven, down to four, to like, hey, this is the basic way to do it 
deal with your forgiveness, let go of, repent of your sin, you know, turn to God, and we're going to bind those demons and send them to the pit. I mean, we try to keep it as simple as we possibly can. All this other That's stuff great. we're talking about today are extra. Hey, if you want to go deeper, if you want to learn more, just like if you go to boot camp, you know, you're going to go for months and learn about practices and this and that. And we are soldiers. I mean, we are learning. We do have armor. We're in a battle. So I don't ever see anything wrong with going and teaching these things and going deeper say in spiritual warfare. There, there's probably a difference in our in our orthopraxy. So everyone listening, um, the, there's two different terms. Okay, There's orthodoxy. It's what we all believe. And there's orthopraxy and what we do. Okay, So I think there's gonna just going to be a nuanced difference between our orthopraxy um, and, and our brother Isaiah here in that there's a bit of difference in the way that we practice those things. Like um, you mentioned um, revelatory preaching. And you mentioned the difference between like a, a continuationist and a cessationist. One of us is right on the continuation and cessationist thing, right? One, someone is objectively correct on on that, and and we are fallible in our interpretation, certainly. Um, with the the subject of revelatory preaching, now this is a this is what the Spirit showed me in the text. We have a video that we've done on Gnosticizing Scripture um, that I would just say that maybe maybe some viewers might want to go check that out. I think that 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 approach is actually done um i i i don't know that it's been that helpful to the charismatic movement at large i do think that that you can um glean truth like you said okay you, you're you're watching jesus from afar are there texts that explicitly say that yes there are i would use those texts to say those things um rather than um trying to spiritually like for example okay woman with the issue of blood has the issue for 12 years and Jairus' daughter is is you know uh, 12 years old and Jesus gets off of the boat and he's walking uh, to heal Jairus' daughter the, the girl and then and then a woman with the issue of blood comes up and touches the hem of his garment and suddenly uh, her flow of blood seizes up right and, and who touched me and you know this woman gets healed and he goes and heals Jairus' daughter someone come to that text and say see 12 represents the number of government I think God was showing to me this is uh, the young church and this is the old church and the young church uh, is this woman who's not be able to turn 13 she's not able to enter into her inheritance this older woman's not able to produce offspring so this is symbolically the the old generation and the new generation they just both need a touch from jesus and this is a revivalistic sermon now that's quite revelatory but but it is also yeah. the exact opposite of what the text says and the text actually has a meaning and when we impose a spiritual interpretation on that text we're actually teaching people to read deeper into the text and what the text says itself so, so that's an orthopraxical difference between the. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't preach a sermon like that. I would say Jesus healed the woman with the issue of blood. He displays that he has the authority over life and over death by healing the woman who can't give birth, right, um, and, and the woman who had actually died. That he's displaying his authority over these things, and this is part of that gospel message. And I would just take the text as value and say, what, what is the text saying itself, and then extrapolate those points. Um, it, so, and, and and I'll be very, very clear. This is also a very cultural difference, right? Um, different denominations, different church cultures are going to handle these things in different ways. Can I can I tell you though, honestly, that does an older generation need a touch from Jesus? Yes, is that true? Hundred percent, it is. Does a young church movement need a touch from Jesus? Yes, absolutely, it's hundred percent true. But but again, I would look to the points of Scripture that speak to that rather than um, spiritualizing a text that doesn't explicitly state that. Um, Anyway, anyway, that 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 being said, there's a there's an I think an orthopraxical difference between the way that we're approaching this um, and the way that Isaiah is approaching this, while agreeing on the essentials. Right? We actually agree yeah. on the 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 demonology side. We agree that there are spirits that aren't in Scripture. We agree that the way that we cast out demons is exactly the same. We we agree that the demonic activity gets in. By, by work of sin and realizing that, hey, it's okay to have that area of disagreement as brothers because we are agreeing on those essential things. Uh, and again, I, I hope people who are listening don't hear combativeness, but what they hear is is brothers trying to process out what is truth and how do we wrestle through that. And hopefully both Isaiah and we are, are equipping you with discernment on how to suss all of that out. Uh, Michael, yeah, been... and I know a lot of people in the chat are asking about, um, they've been asking, I've been just barely checking it just because I don't want to be distracted by what the chat is saying. Sure, sure. It's about Christians having demons. I don't know if that's something you guys have touched on. What is your guys's, and I'm asking like genuinely, I'm curious, understanding mm -hmm. on Christians having demons, can they, uh, do you guys ascribe to like, 
I, I teach basically the Bible or the New Testament doesn't definitively say whether someone's oppressed or possessed. It's a, it's a, like an English translation. Demonized, so I always say it's demonized is the king is the um, original Greek, which yep. it, you know is a poor translation when you take demonized to possess with devils. Like I, I teach Christians can't be possessed, but I also teach possession is a English word that was not found in the original Greek. What is your guys' teaching on when someone says, hey, can a Christian have a demon? How do you um, look at that from scripture? Yeah, we, we do the exact same thing. We just say that the best word is demonized, which means to be influenced or oppressed by a demon. And we, we tend to say, uh, and we've done videos on this, encourage you guys in the, in the chat to go back and watch our videos, just search demons and you'll find plenty of them <laughs> under Remnant Radio. But um, anyway, so we teach to think of it like on a scale of one to 10, maybe, um, just kind of a practical outworking of some of these texts. Um, we see people demonized all throughout the scripture. Uh, but not every case is the same. I mean, you have uh, the the Gerasene demoniac who's you know scraping himself and he's living in the tombs and he's naked and violent. Okay, that that's a crazy, dude. That's that's a serious case of demonization. Uh, call that a ten. And then on the scale of one, uh, Ephesians four twenty six and twenty to twenty seven, it says, "Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil a foothold." Well holding on to your anger, which is unforgiveness, for a single day gives the devil a foothold in your life. Does that mean that a day of unforgiveness makes you the garrison demoniac and you're naked in the graveyard scraping yourself with pottery? <laughs> no, I not. sure hope not, right? <laughs> yeah. So maybe we call a day, a day old grudge a one, and maybe we call the other dude a 10, and it can, it can be kind of anywhere in between. And then I don't even feel a need to even distinguish between possessed or not possessed because that's not actually biblical language that comes from yeah. the old King James days. So I just don't even worry about possessed. Now, uh, the question of can a Christian get a demon? Well, can a Christian hold a grudge? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, yes, a Christian can be demonized. How demonized can a Christian be? Well, then we enter into the realm of theory uh, we don't really know, but uh, I mean, it seems like a, a Christian could hold a really, really bad grudge. A Christian can get really, really bad into sin. So probably a Christian can get really, really demonized, I would guess. And of course, I've seen that too. But, um, but any Christians form of be affliction, demonized? Right? Yes. Any I form. Mean, well, yeah. So the Apostle Certainly. Paul, we, we don't have the word possessed in Scripture, but the Apostle Paul said, hey, a demon was sent, you know, from Satan to buffet me, right, in Second Corinthians. That would be the verb demonized, right? Like that would be, I mean, the, the, the text itself doesn't say demonized, but any activity of a demon is demonization. So Paul is saying there was demonic activity around in my life oppressing me in some way. We're not saying that he was a level 10 meat puppet, right? Like that's my favorite phrase to use when talking to people about this because they, they think of demonization <laughs> in terms of horror films when someone's a meat puppet walking around being controlled by a demon. Yeah. Uh, a, a helpful, I think, text is Luke 13, uh, the woman uh, who's hunched over, uh, the, the scripture yeah. calls her a daughter of Abraham. Uh, this is speaking, you know, we're children of Abraham if we identify uh, with God by faith. We were deemed righteous by faith. So this this was a daughter of Abraham, which I think is a helpful uh, distinction. Now, this is different than the new birth, the regeneration that happens post-cross. Um, so I think that that's helpful for a distinction. Is there tons of scriptures that say, hey, you can be demonized? No, but we do see activity where Paul warns us to like, hey, put on the armor of God, the, 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 the demonic error uh, uh, they're fiery and they can consume you. That seems like some kind of demonic affliction of some kind. And again, we just use that same verb. It's some form of demonization. Um, again, there's question on meat puppet, you know, level demonization. Uh, but that's an entirely, I think, different different conversation. Yeah, yeah I've but, always but told you. People if go ahead, go ahead, Isaiah. Well, I was just going to oh, say see. is that. <laughs> Sorry. You guys are we're so a cute. Behind. We're we're behind a little bit here. Go ahead, you go for real this time. <laughs> Uh, okay. We're so, we're so Christian brotherly, aren't we? Just oh, you go first. <laughs> you guys are both sanctified. Uh, we're sweet. Anyway, over here. I, I was just going to make, make note of the fact that even though we, we have had a few disagreements along the way, this seems to be a point that we pretty much agree upon. Yeah. Uh, uh, Christians can be demonized. We agree on the ways that they can be demonized. And we also seem to agree on the way you cast the demon out. Uh, get people, you know, you cast the demon out, you, you command it to go and wherever it's called for, call the person to repentance, 
to confession of their sin, to forgive somebody, you know, get them to walk these steps. But basically it's commanding the demons to go. And if the demon isn't going, what, what sin is the person holding on to that's given the demon right to be there? And so we address that. So it sounds like you pretty much do the same thing we do. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I do deliverance ministry at, with this guy. When it comes to talking to demons, people say, well, why? And if you look at Jesus, the, the man at the tombs, Jesus commanded the demon to leave and the demon didn't leave. That's what the text says. The demon started talking and volunteering its name. One thing we always teach, or at least I practice and teach, is that we don't immediately start talking to the demon. We command it to go. The only time we engage in conversation if the demon refuses to leave. So, you know, give it a few minutes, That's command good. it to go, do I your like thing. That. If it doesn't leave, like what Jesus, and this is the son of God, y'all. This is God in the flesh. Um, then we engage in the conversation. It's always for the means of interrogating, not conversating. So we're not trying to have a, hey, what'd you do yesterday? And do, are you in my other friends and family? We're not <laughs> conversating with demons. We're not sitting there having lunch with them, inviting them out to eat. We're just, hey, this is the information I need. Why are you there? Why aren't you leaving? Maybe what your name is, if it doesn't volunteer, and then going from there. But for me, I think if we over rely on talking to the demon or getting information, we under rely on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, whether it be a word of knowledge, whether it be, you know, a discerning of spirits gift, like we have the Holy Ghost, we have Amen. God in us. He has way better information than the demon's going to have. And I tell people all the time, did you pray? Did you ask God what that could be? Like, I didn't even think of that. I'm like, man, you're asking the demon, but like, why not go to God? And so, yeah, I would totally agree on the Christians having demons. Let me just pose one question to those that are in the chat right now that are, you know, Christians can't have demons. There's no way, brother. If a Christian can't have a demon, just guys, hear me here. Then there's no point in deliverance ministry because all we would have to do is get them saved. Just get them saved. And then you never have to deal with deliverance because they ought, the demons leave once they become a Christian. This idea is an unscriptural idea. The Bible never Good teaches point. that just get people saved. And then we don't, if you look at Acts 8, Philip preaches, they heed his message, they respond, and he casts out demons. So Philip, why are you casting out demons? Um, why don't you just preach and get them saved? You're wasting your time. There's no need for deliverance. And then the other question, that's number one. The second question I would, I guess, have for those that are maybe cessationists in the chat, those that don't believe is, where did all the demons go? That is oh, my yeah. question. If you don't believe deliverance is for today, the gifts or whatever, you know, some cessationists believe in deliverance, but not the gifts. There's a lot of flavors. But <laughs> those that say deliverance is not for today, I'm like, where are they at? Because there's tons of demons when Jesus was around, enough for him to do it everywhere he went. But now you're telling me we don't need it anymore because the demons, are they on like a long vacation till the book of Revelation? In my mind, I'm like, hey, demons are still here today. Jesus dealt with them this way. There's only one Amen. way to deal with demons and that's to cast them out. There's no multiple ways. One of the reasons why, and I know the chat earlier was saying, the courts of heaven, Israel, they are, I don't teach the courts of heaven. I don't teach a lot of the stuff that, charismatics teach when it comes to deliverance because i can't find it in scripture now your experience is your experience but for me if i'm going to teach a method and say this is what the bible says i have to make sure because of my audience that this is a scriptural method if jesus didn't talk to the demon at the tombs i would say don't ever talk to a demon y'all i don't care what you say there's no scriptural backing because to me it's a big deal but because jesus did engage in conversation um, I think it's okay to, if you need to. Another interesting point when it comes to, which I know we can go hours on this, talking to demons is there's not one verse in the Bible where a demon lies, which is crazy to think about because people say, oh, if you talk to the demon, they're going to lie to you. And there's actually not one place in scripture where a demon lied to a disciple, to God. Every time Jesus encountered demons, they told the truth. You're the son of God. What do you want from us? Have you heard it come to judge us before the time? So I think um, people might mystify deliverance and say, oh, the demons always lie every time. I've found, maybe you guys have found something different. Demons oftentimes do not want to be there. They want to go. They want to be cast out. They're, you know, tortured by the fact the person's praying and fasting and worshiping. And so oftentimes they'll tell you what you need to know and they want to get out of there. So, um, yeah, I think that we do have to be careful though, getting into, Hey, should we talk about this? Talk about that. I always say it's for interrogation, not conversation. That's good. That's good. <laughs> and this is that part of the show when Josh puts the camera on me. No, bro, so you had your hand on the mic. I thought you were going to unmute the microphone. I mean, we've been dude. almost two hours here, man. We're so going, here's the we're, thing. I think, going for it today. I, think, I think we're getting to a good spot where we can we can wrap up because, uh, you know, our, our primary points of contention were on, um, you know, prophecy and deliverance. If there was any contention on that whatsoever, it sounds like there's quite a bit of actual agreement on these things. So uh, I think this is a great place to wrap up. Um, you know, Isaiah, this is what I would ask. Um, 
I want to get some closing thoughts on you as far as how Christians in the charismatic space, when someone is um, uh, critical, because I think you've displayed a really good heart and charity here. Um, how would you say, like, if people are watching this and uh, and they're a charismatic, they practice the gifts, they do the stuff, and someone is saying, hey, brother, like, I think that this could be done differently. Can you speak to, like, how, how we should respond to criticism? Because I think you made a really good point earlier. You talked about how, man, if people aren't doing the stuff, you know, you don't take financial advice from a hobo, right? So you yeah. don't need tons of deliverance advice from people who don't believe demons are a thing, right? But at the same time, we do have Christian brothers uh, who the Bible says iron's going to sharpen iron. And, and honestly, I think this is extremely courageous. We've never had someone that we've been that we've criticized before on the show come onto the show and give pushback and, and talk through some of these things with us. And I think it's been super fruitful. And I think as a charismatic community at large, we've got to be able to say we disagree and still maintain unity in the bond of peace. So I'd really want to know what would be your exhortation for people? Hey, let's strive for truth, but also strive for unity. How, how would you go about doing that and encourage people to do that? Yeah, I would say for the most part, correction is not rejection. Um, even like just when I first got sent your video, I'm like another guy in my mind. I'm like another guy on YouTube that's mad that I cast out demons. He's offended that I believe Christians can have demons because it does 99% of the videos, right? Mm -hmm. Like I've never had a money scandal. I've never had a bit dishonest in my marriage. I've never dealt with any type of scandal ever. Like there's nothing you can find on me dirt wise because I'm an open book. I'm living this thing out for real. I'm not going to turn my stream off and then go drink. Like I'm, I'm really about this life. I really believe what I'm preaching today. But I would say when people bring correct correction, hear their correction. If they're doing it with the right heart, there's a guy, um, several guys on YouTube that say, you know, I'm not saved. I'm not a brother. You know, one of them is because I believe in Genesis six, which is an orthodox belief that the fallen angels breed bred with people and created Nephilim. So he sure. thinks because I believe that he says, Oh, Isaiah's false. He's going to hell. He's not real. Would I go on that guy's show? Common. Of course I'm not going to. Yeah. Of course, <laughs> this is an orthodox belief. A lot of people and Hebrew scholars believe that, but I'm not going to go on a guy who's calling me out saying, you're not saved. You're of the devil. You know, you're going to hell and then say, Oh, by the way, Isaiah, come on my channel. And then he wonders why I won't come on. So I would say, man, if you're bringing correction with love, which I think you guys have done, I mean, I, I again, skim through some of these videos, the one in the prophetic word. And for me, you were like, Hey, this is not, um, this is not wrong, but it's not necessarily uh, precise or like, uh, what, what were we saying earlier? Like, it's not, um, it's not, it's hard it's, to judge because it's sure. vague. It's vague. So I was like, okay, look, this guy's not coming at me sideways. He's not over here calling me a false teacher, false prophet. I'll go on and talk with him. He does deliverance. They're in supernatural ministry. So yeah, I mean, I'm not going to go on and throw my pearls to swine and talk to guys that don't believe in anything I'm preaching or saying and don't believe that we should cast their demons. I mean, I may if they're if they're honest about it and if they're humble and if they're willing to be taught. And for me, if I'm going to hear somebody talk that has more experience than me in an area, I'm going to listen and say, man, I want to learn. Like, I'm trying to learn what you have to say. I'm not coming arrogantly saying, oh, I know it all. Like, hey, teach me. And I, I think today I, I feel that way. I'm listening to you guys saying, hey, show me. What do you think? Tell me. I'm, I'm listening. So I think being just taking, being humble, be humble in your approach, be humble in your response, be willing to learn, stay submitted under covering. I will say this, it's major to be under spiritual authority not because there's a million verses. Some people say, well, that's not in the Bible, but because they're looking out for blind spots. We all have blind spots. Mm. I have spiritual fathers that call me and say, hey, be careful when you say this. Hey, I, I will, guys, I will be live and I'll have spiritual fathers text me and say, hey, I think you should go back and recorrect what you said there. I think someone might have, and I'm live reading their text while I'm live. And then I'll say, hey guys, I didn't mean this. I meant that if I said it wrong. And so, yeah, I think we need to stay submitted under that. I'll be willing to take correction, especially if we're in the supernatural ministry. And a lot of people think we're just these you who charismatics that are crazy, that don't know the Bible. I'm here to say, listen, you can be normal. You can be biblically accurate. You don't have to be weird and still believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, um, deliverance, signs and wonders. Like we're really out here doing this thing for real with the Bible. We're preaching, we're praying for people, we're feeding the poor. We're doing what you guys are doing that don't agree with us. Um, we're, we're real people. And if you're commenting and you're, you know, a Facebook troll or a couch theologian or YouTube prophet on the comment sections, a keyboard warrior, just remember you're commenting and we're real people reading your comments, right? <laughs> Some people are so quick to say, oh, you guys are this or remnant radio is this, or Isaiah is this. And you know, there could be people in here today saying things about you and saying things about me. Like we're real people. We're working it out. We're trying, we're talking, we're dialoguing, we're humbling ourselves. Uh, I'm on here after they've critiqued me in several videos, but I'm like, hey, I don't have any 
bad blood towards you guys. I don't have any ill intent. You guys are brothers and we're all going after the same thing and let's sharpen each other. Let's partner together. Let's collab. There's 900 people watching right now. Let's, let's train, let's teach, let's yeah, collab amen. together. Let's merge audiences. Cause I don't see any, any negative from that. So there's my yeah. long answer. Like I always give. Yeah, no, no, no. It's great. <laughs> we, and I, so there's, man, I need prayer. there's more collabs to going forward, man. Like whether that's swapping deliverance stories, like Miller said, you know, maybe we get to go. I, man, I would, I would have you come and preach. I would have no, no, uh, if I, if I was a pastor of a local church, I would have no hesitation. Just in don't doing preach that, on the woman with the issue of together. blood. I got don't, you. Don't, yeah, just no, don't do that one. That'd be a good call. <laughs> good call, bro. Good call. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> cool, man. Well, I guess for me, a, a closing thought would be, I know I said this several times, but the sufficiency of scripture, it's a doctrine that so many Christians don't know, but, but it actually, it speaks to both the charismatic and the cessationist in different ways to the charismatic. It's if, if what you've learned about deliverance or what you've learned about prophecy or what you've learned about any of the gifts it is such that you have to have this knowledge in order to achieve the fullness of godliness and in, uh, and growth in your friendship with Jesus, then you're missing the sufficiency of Scripture. The sufficiency yeah. of Scripture means we have everything we need for life and godliness. If I need to know what such and such teacher teaches me in order to cast out demons, if I need to know uh, read this person's book in order to access the courts of heaven and, and unlock mysteries and realities. If I need to do all of these things, you see what it does is it puts this teacher in a position where they actually know more than Paul did. And the whole church throughout history, they didn't have this truth. You guys, what, what we need is not new truth. We need to just go back to the old truth, the truth of the gospel. And so charismatics need this because because we do believe it, that God gives revelation today, where, where we go too far is we turn our revelation into a teaching for all people. And we've got to separate that. We teach from written revelation, which is the scripture. Outside revelation, such as prophetic revelation, is for encouragement and for building up, but it's not for establishing new doctrines. So, so that's where charismatics need sufficiency of scripture. But cessationists need sufficiency of scripture too. Because the reason we're all having this conversation here is that we believe that the scriptures are sufficient to teach us to use the spiritual gifts, all of the spiritual gifts. The very reason that we believe in prophecy, the re very reason that we pursue prophecy, healing, tongues, interpretation, and all the rest, the reason we pursue them is because the all-sufficient scriptures command us to. And yes, nowhere amen. in those scriptures, those all-sufficient scriptures, are we taught to be skeptical of those gifts, that those gifts are somehow to go away one day. And my challenge to the cessationist out there would be, how can you possibly say that you believe in the sufficiency of scriptures when those very scriptures tell you to eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. If you have to do gymnastics like nobody's business to make the Bible mean what the opposite of what it says, then you're not believing in the sufficiency of scriptures. So I would say, charismatic cessationists, let's come together and let's believe in the all-sufficient scriptures that give us everything we need for life and godliness. So that's what I would leave you with. No, that's great. And and guys, if if you ever hear uh, even pushback when we give to Isaiah, it, it is not a, a personal attack or a personal push. But we're, we're coming into this space where, and Isaiah affirms this as well, right? Where we see on most of the charismatic publishers, most of the charismatic conferences, we have the prophetic voices that are out there not only didn't repent of getting the Trump prophecies wrong, they doubled down on these things. They're releasing all of these books about these n new practices that are nowhere found in scripture that, that are not just non-biblical, they're extra biblical. And we as careful continuationists, we believe in the gifts, but we want to keep things biblically rooted. What we do is we see, um, we see the danger I, I believe personally, and I can't speak for everybody, I believe personally that the charismatic movement is primed for the greatest revival in human history, but I also think that they're primed for the greatest deception ever in human history. And I think if charismatics as a whole, leaders in this space, don't begin calling for discernment and don't begin having critical conversations like the one we're having right now where we can get together with people we disagree with and really wrestle through these things, what's going to happen is we're going to grow an entire generation of charismatic followers who are just told what to believe, who don't use their brain, and they're going to be swept away by every wind of doctrine. We've got to love God with all of our heart, 
with all of our mind, with all of our soul and our strength, not excluding that mind piece, not not forgetting that that we're supposed to love God with all of our mind, right? We want to experience, know the breadth, length, depth, height of the love of God. Those are all measurements. We can, we can weigh those things and we want to experience that love of God that surpasses knowledge. The only way for us to do that is contend and believe, to be obedient to the scriptures, to fight for truth while maintaining a bond of peace. We've got to find a way to do this. Uh, and guys, I just, again, I can't commend Isaiah enough. Every time I listen, uh, and I've said this in all the videos we've been critical of, every time I listen uh, to you speak, I have always heard uh, Christ exalted, uh, a repentance of sin, a faith towards God. Uh, and of those things, it stirs my heart. Like when you speak, it stirs my heart to to excitement, to intimacy with Jesus. Uh, and again, if, if you're not following Isaiah, you need to go check out uh, his channel. Uh, it, it's just his name. You'll see it in the description of this video. I'll, I'll link his channel at the bottom of this video. You can go over to his channel, subscribe, get tons of great teachings there. Uh, and Isaiah, I did say, we all believe this. I only meant in context with uh, the, the prophets who didn't repent and a bunch of wacky charismatic teachings. I don't want to put words in your mouth. If, if you if you need uh, to backpedal a little bit, uh, feel free to, no, 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 to no. do that. No, yeah. it's all good. It's cool, all good, cool. man. I'm excited to be on here with you guys. And again, um, this is my first time ever coming on when someone's yeah. like, hey, we have this criticism, but I think it's healthy. I think it's good. I'm an open book. I got nothing to hide. And so I'm excited to be on. I know we'll do more. Next time we'll do some type of teaching on something. Something we agree Q &A. on. Yeah. I know there's a lot of, yeah, a lot of questions in the chat. I love doing Q&A. We can do Q&A, whatever, um, mm -hmm. collab. Yeah, and uh, thanks for not jumping. Me, I didn't know if you guys were gonna say, All right, now we got him, guys. All right, we <laughs> locked him in now. No, I'm excited, man. I appreciate you guys. Cool I'm blessings, excited. guys. Yeah, thank you so much. We for don't do in. that. Yeah, thank you so much Go for ahead. tuning in, guys, but, to this episode. Hey, oh, wait, are you you got some thoughts? I did really. I just want to say because some of Isaiah's folks, you're in our chat, subscribe to our channel. We do theology uh, sure, broadcasts, sure. Every, we do theology and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, and for those who are remnant radio fans. Go subscribe to Isaiah's channel, so Isaiah Saldivar. Yeah. So that's really agree. it. Subscribe, subscribe. Yeah, guys, uh, if you're watching the video and you're like, hey, I was blessed by this episode or blessed by other content we produce, and you want to support the ministry, there are links in the description for PayPal or Patreon. Uh, if there's any content you've ever heard me talk about Patreon, you're like, man, I can't afford that. Uh, just shoot me an email, media at theremnantradio.com, uh, and I will go ahead and send that video to you for free because uh, I understand what it's like to be so poor. Your baloney doesn't have a first name. Uh, so for all of you uh, who are watching, make sure to subscribe, like the video, and share it to someone uh, that you think uh, it would be edifying to. And if you're watching this video, one of the videos I'm most proud of that we produced was the healing ministry of Charles Spurgeon. Many people don't know this guy had a wildly successful healing ministry. We released that video just last week. You need to go yeah, check that video week. out. It's super cool and I'm really proud of it. So guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Isaiah, thanks for, for being a good sport thanks, coming on the man, show. For me on. Uh, and guys, we'll see you next week uh, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. We're talking about universalism, uh, condemning that with uh, a fellow charismatic brother. It's going to be exciting. Blessings, guys.